Arthur Curry is Aquaman, and the fight for Atlantis seems to always be ongoing. Welcome to the Comic Story in Full Story series, where we take a collection of complete stories, put them together into one long video to give you a better viewing experience. During the DC Rebirth, DC relaunched their entire universe and started fresh with all of the characters. Today, we are covering the Aquaman story that came out of this relaunch. This will include all of the Aquaman Rebirth that we covered here on the channel, as well as some of Aquaman and Mera from the DC Universe era, as it concluded some of the stories that began in Rebirth. Anyway, this is Aquaman. I hope you enjoy. To begin with, picture the world. A reality check can be humbling. It reminds man of his place in the cosmos. Picture the oceans. Their average depth is two and a half miles. Their maximum, more than seven. They cover two thirds of the planet. Compared to that, any man is insignificant, unless he claims the oceans as his domain and rules over them as Aquaman. Aquaman swims as fast as he can, asking Mera, how far am I? She reports back that the identity is confirmed. It is the deluge. Damn it. Arthur Curry says as he pushes himself to go even faster. You see, taking two thirds of the planet as your space to protect isn't a small job. It's too much for one man, some would say. To be here now, he's ignoring a typhoon in Indonesia, a sea quake in Japan, and a migrant ship in the Mediterranean. Today, Aquaman's priority is the deluge. With that, he swims in, telling them, stop this now, and the man in charge sees him coming. The king himself! No fealty now, deluge. We are sworn to this act! Aquaman dodges some of the shots fired and he realizes that these are Atlanteans that have disagreed with his recent actions. You are no king of mine! Where is your crown? You dress like a surface fool! Aquaman keeps swinging his trident at the enemies. You're rigged for war. Let me guess, your plan is to level a city in unsuspecting America? The deluge has bided its time long enough waiting for you to act, king. You have not! As a creature of the sea charges into Aquaman, the leader of the deluge informs him, the surface will burn for Atlantis. Not for Atlantis. This is never for Atlantis. While this is happening, the people at the embassy for Atlantis are debating his actions. He is fighting against the Atlanteans to protect surface worlders. But Mera corrects them. Those are terrorists. They are not fighting for the betterment of Atlantis. Then she tells all of the units to hold, unless the fight gets closer to land. To the world, Aquaman is a superhero, a member of the Justice League, comrade to Superman and Wonder Woman. But the Drylanders seem to think that he talks to fish. This is untrue. He has a telepathic gift that allows him to compel marine life. They are not smart enough to hold a comrade conversation with him. However, this myth has made him a popular running joke in pop culture. To the few Drylanders that have seen his true power, there aren't enough to give any real credibility to the power of the king. Then we cut to a newsroom where we discover one individual has been explaining all of this to a news anchor. So are you telling me, Dr. Taylor, that Aquaman isn't like the other superheroes? David, he's the head of state to a foreign power. That brings baggage with it. But back at our fight, which is happening as this news article is going on, Aquaman leaps out of the water with the sea creature in tow. He then punches the sea creature so hard that he knocks its teeth out and the leader of the deluge hits the shore. With a few simple swings, Aquaman drops the leader and he claims victory. Then as he wipes his mouth, he asks, Why? The land enslaves us and you! Why today? Because tomorrow is too late! Aquaman drops him and he tells Mera, It's done. Send the drift quietly to secure the prisoners. Then, Aquaman meets Mera at Sam's, his favorite seafood place, and our news anchor continues. On the one hand, he is undoubtedly the man who believes that he is striving for a better, safer world. He is undoubtedly a superhero, a hero of the first rank. He is a king. Those on the surface see him as a punchline or a menace, and a large part of the Atlanteans resent his rule. He fights a daily battle to balance the always conflicting interests of his parent worlds. He is a man of peace at war with everything around him. Even the fish don't actually talk to him. Mera tells Arthur that the drift rounded up all of the terrorists, and then some clam chowder is brought over to their table. Curious, she asks what it is, and Arthur tells her that it's chowder, so she tries it and likes it. Arthur tells her that if she doesn't like it, she doesn't have to eat it. He can tell that she's just tolerating the surface world for him, from the food to the dry land. Of course, Arthur, you are important to me. I gave my heart to you. My fear is that you ask too much of yourself. But while everyone is looking at Aquaman's situation, someone is watching that news report and he wants his revenge for the death of his father. Black Manta is ready to bring the fight back to Arthur Curry. 
As the morning sun begins to rise, Arthur Curry, aka Aquaman, looks out from his lighthouse with his fiance Mara preparing for the big day. Today will hopefully be the day that he can finally make the bridge between the people of the land and the people of the sea. The surface has feared Atlantis just as Atlantis has never trusted the surface, and thanks to his dear brother Orm, the surface has plenty of reason to fear Atlantis. Mara tells him he'll be fine. She's proud of him for what he's doing, and she'll be with him every step of the way. But as they go back to their lighthouse, someone watches them from afar. Later on the Atlantean Dry Land Embassy, Spindrift Station, people and reporters begin to arrive, but among them is Joanna Stubbs of the Royal British Navy to take her position as the British Navy liaison to Atlantis. Everyone has a chance to enter the embassy, and then they hear a voice call out to him that it is an honor for them to be here today. Arthur continues stating that his name is Arthur Curry, or as the world calls him, Aquaman. And welcome to the Atlantean Embassy. He wanted to bring the world press and international agencies here today to give them a tour of the Spin Drift facility and answer any questions that they may have. This will be a meeting point, a place to learn about one another, but first, they must eat and enjoy themselves. As Joanna and Ray Delane, a reporter for the Daily Planet, Look at the hors d'oeuvres. Ray begins to ask, what is this, some kind of shrimp? An Atlantean guard tells him that it is a lockway, something that they would call a sea slug? And Ray begins to gag, asking where the restroom is. After running off, Mara begins to tell the guard that he should go check on Mr. Delane. She would rather not have a bad trip advisor over their food here. The guard goes to check on the man, and he finds him hunched over in a hallway, and that's that he notices something along the walls. As he looks closer, he finds explosives, and then his head is slammed into the wall. Ray says that there is really no Ray Delane, and then his body begins to change as he stabs the guard in the neck. Suddenly, back in the conference room, explosions begin to go off and the aquatic compartments begin to pour in. Mara holds the water back from flooding and tells Arthur to find the culprit. But as Arthur leaves, a figure begins to appear from the water, shooting Mara, stating, Of all the things he could lose, she will hurt him the most. Then from the waters, Arthur jumps out with his trident, stabbing Black Manta, stating, You will never stop, will you? And Manta asks him, Would you if I had murdered your father? And the two begin to fight back and forth. Black Manta manages to stab Arthur, telling him, What you're trying to do here, you're deluded. The world is afraid of you as they should be, and I have come here to end the war. As Arthur falls back, Black Manta tells him that it's time for round two, and that he clicks the detonator, setting off more explosions around the entire facility. Arthur then tells Joanna to take Mara out of there, and that his back is slammed against the wall, stabbing the spear through him into the wall. Joanna asks what he's doing, and then Arthur pushes forward, pulling himself through the spear, and he tells her, go! Arthur jumps back into the fight, telling Manta that his father was no innocent, and God knows that he isn't either, but killing his father was the worst mistake that he's ever made as Aquaman. The boy who killed your father was not ready to be Aquaman, but Aquaman could not exist without the burden of that mistake. This endless feud achieves nothing, and Manta asks, nothing? Just look at what I've done. I've crushed your dreams. I've shamed you in the eyes of the world, and I've sundered any hope of a union between Atlantis and the surface. But as Manta stands over him, stating, no one walks away from a blood feud like ours. Arthur Arthur tells him, if you choose to stop, but Manta tells him, he won't ever. Arthur tells him, if that's the way it must be, then I will end this. And he grabs his trident and he begins slashing away at Manta, knocking his helmet off and pinning him to the wall. Manta tells him, go on, do it, damn you. Kill me, and you will forever be tarnished for killing me. But if I kill Aquaman, I will avenge my father. So either way, morally or literally, Aquaman loses. Aquaman lowers the trident, telling him, fine, then kill me. And then what? Being Aquaman means that I have a life. One with meaning. You though, if you kill me, you'll be left with nothing. Nothing I can do to you will ever be enough. Manta remains silent and he throws down the trident and Arthur says, you're empty and I'm truly sorry for you. You miss your father every day and I'm sorry that I took him from you. A short while later, the military arrives and they arrest Black Manta and they take him away. But during the car ride, an explosion goes off, flipping the transport with Manta. He crawls out asking, who the hell are you? And the woman tells him, we could be friends. We have mutual interests. So let's go find out where this can lead. The next day, Commander Merck of the Atlantean Royal Guard is stopped from entering the embassy. The military tells him that they are secure the area, and Arthur appears asking what seems to be the problem. Merck says that this wretch is barring us from entering, and Arthur stops him, telling him, stand down. What is going on? The man says the State Department revoked the embassy status at six this morning. Their orders are to let no one into this former embassy, and right now, they don't want an incident. Arthur assures him, there won't be one. Are you really that afraid of us? And the man says, 
We don't want to be, but we have our reasons. Boston, New York, Metropolis. And Arthur then asks, who do I speak to about this then? Elsewhere, in an abandoned airfield in Maine, Black Manta sits with a woman known as Blackjack, and she tells him that they are with Nemo. She tells him that he put on quite a show yesterday, single-handedly taking down the Atlantean embassy. It's just a hunch, but she assumes that he really doesn't like Aquaman, does he? Manta says that he's still waiting for an explanation, and Blackjack says, well, she's come to make you a job offer. Nemo can use you and your talents, so we're gonna go ahead and uncuff you now. Manta shakes takes his wrists as the cuffs fall off, stating, thanks, but no thanks. I can get them off myself. He then gets up, hitting one of the guards and kicking the other one away. While he continues to fight off the guards, Blackjack tells him, a man of your capabilities just seems like a damn shame wasting them on an obsession like vengeance when you could be doing so much more. Manta stops asking, what did you say? And she tells him, Nemo has no love for Aquaman, but he is right about some things. We should have a proper conversation. If things go well, you can meet the boss. Over in Washington, Arthur and Mara meet with the Chief of Staff, Mr. Gantry of the White House. Arthur says that he is here to request the reinstatement of the diplomatic status of Atlantis and the resumption of the dialogue between their two nations. Closing the embassy this morning was not a friendly act. Mr. Gantry says, listen, your majesty, but relations have never been good, and that's a shame. During your people's struggle for the throne of Atlantis, cities in the U.S. mainland suffered a massive damage and lost many civilian lives. But while they're continuing their discussions, out in the South Atlantic aboard a U.S. ship, an explosion goes off. While some of the crew members try to evacuate the passengers, one of them sees a shadow looming over them. And then that shadow shouts, In the name of Atlantis, the deluge sweeps you away. Back in the White House, the agents enter the conference with Arthur and Mara stating that he's sorry, but he's arresting Aquaman under the Patriot Act for crimes against the U.S. 32 minutes ago, a U.S. ship had lost all hands in the South Atlantic, and the ones responsible for the attack is being claimed by Atlantis. Arthur is then cuffed, and Mara tells the agents to stop, but Arthur Arthur tells her not to do anything. This was a mistake and we will prove it. Don't do anything rash, Mara. She asks if he just expects her to watch as they drag him away in chains and he tells her, that's exactly what I expect you to do. After Arthur is taken away, Mara contacts Tula, the regent Arthur appointed while he was away to explain the current situation. Tula tells her that she understands how much she would like to lash out and free their king. However, he is going to try and forge peace with this land. Mara slowly begins to calm down and then she asks if they're investigating what the Americans are claiming, which Tula tells Tells her she is working on right now. As the call ends, Captain Saran reports that the drift, the elite Royal Atlantean guards, are approaching the wrecked ship now. Merck reports over the radio that they are now accessing the shipwreck, and upon looking at the damages, they can determine that Atlantean war tech was used to bring it down. And while looking into it further, Merck finds an Atlantean war sword stuck into the ship, but this is a 5th Dynasty sword, an heirloom blade. No Atlantean soldier would ever leave it stuck in the hull of a ship. Whoever did this deliberately left it to leave a mark, to indicate responsibility and discredit the Atlantean people. But before the investigation could go any further, Merck hears someone calling out to them, and when they look up, they see a group of American special forces. The soldiers tell them to submit immediately, and Tula tells them to break away and withdraw. Do not engage! Then the radio goes silent. Down in Arthur's holding cell, an agent asks what exactly is the deluge, and Arthur tells them that they are are a terrorist group, or rather were, the Atlantean xenophobes, but he shut them down. The agent then mentions the last transmissions from the ship mentioned the deluge among Atlantis, and if the Atlantean radicals acted outside of his control, Arthur, realizing what's going on, tells them that they must let him go. They were intending to attack the U.S. mainland. If you leave me locked up in here, there isn't anything that I can do to stop them. However, behind the guards, Mara bursts through, knocking the guards out, stating that she decided she doesn't like being here in Washington, and she'd very much like to go home now. Arthur tries to tell her that she can't, but she rips the cell door off, telling him shots have been fired. Atlantean U.S. forces have engaged. It's not by you, it's not by me, and not by Tula, but the war is about to break out. As the two of them run out of the cell and exit the jail, Arthur begins to ask which way is the closest body of water, and Mara points, stating eight miles in that direction. Arthur asks, that way? Because in front of them, the entire U.S. military begins to surround them. The military then receives word that they can go in hot, and they begin opening fire on Arthur and Mara. Mara begins to avoid the bullets and she jumps onto a tank ripping his cannon off. The soldiers then tell her, holy crap! And Mara says, good day! And she punches him, then tosses the cannon at one of the helicopters. Arthur then leaps in to catch the falling helicopter telling her, no one dies today. After setting the helicopter down, the two begin fighting off the military in non-lethal ways and just knocking out any soldier in their path. But while Arthur and Mara attempt to escape, down in Atlantis, Captain Saran reports Merck and the Drift managed to escape from the American Navy, but they intercepted the U.S. transmissions. 
their king and lady Mera are now under attack by significant US military forces. They have been ordered to kill them, and Tula tells him to mobilize the war fleet. Over in Antarctica, after some convincing, Blackjack takes Black Manta to see their leader, the Fisher King. He says Blackjack says that he would make a fine addition to their inner circle, and Manta asks if he is the Fisher King. The Fisher King responds with yes, but it's just a title. I'm really Lord of the World. I hold power and influence beyond your imagination. So tell me why I should give you a share of that. Manta tells him, you're thinking too small. I can show you how to think much bigger. Back in Washington, the US forces continue to pursue Arthur and Mera, and they continue forcing their way through the forces. But as Mera rips off another gun turret, Arthur tells her to stop. Mera looks up and says, oh, and Superman tells her, that's some pretty good advice. I think we should talk about this now, Arthur. Superman says that he just spoke with the president, and whatever this is, it's going to end right now. Arthur looks at him, stating, The president of the United States believes that I am an international terrorist, an enemy of the state, and now it seems that you have become their enforcer, Superman. Superman tells him, no, the president did call him, but he came voluntarily to help. He was told about the situation, and right now he just wants to resolve this. Arthur turns away, stating, If you trusted me, you wouldn't be standing in my way. Then as he tries to walk away, Superman grabs his shoulder, telling him, You can't leave. Arthur asks him, I can't leave? I am a king! And he swings both of his fists, cracking Superman in the face, launching him away. Superman then punches him back, stating, I won't step aside. Let me come to Atlantis with you. Perhaps you need help. Then Mera runs in, punching him. He already has help! Arthur and Mera begin attacking from both sides, while Arthur says that he's tried to get past it. The beloved Trinity, that is Superman, Diana, and Batman. The loyal and true trio, Lantern, Flash, and Cyborg. Then there's him, the Mulwark, the Black Sheep. That's how he sees himself being seen among the Justice League. The punches continue to fly, each side knocking each other away, and then Superman grabs Arthur by the arm, slamming him into a tree, telling him that they have a responsibility to demonstrate. The Justice League is not above the law. Just come with him now. They can even call the league in to help. But Arthur kicks him away asking, why? So you can undermine the hell out of me? I'm the one that needs to do this. For the good of Atlantis, I have to fix this. I am their king. Please give me the chance to show what that means or there's no damn point in me existing at all. Darkness begins to cover the battlefield as the entire Atlantean war fleet arrives. And Superman asks him, so peaceful intentions, huh, Arthur? Arthur tells him, don't be an idiot. Their king is under attack. And then Superman asks him, what are they waiting for? The Atlantean army stands ready and Arthur says, they're waiting for me to say attack. Arthur then holds his hand out, telling Tula to hold her fire. They're done here. He has stopped this war and now he's going to prevent the next one. He then asks Superman, are you going to stand in my way? And Superman tells him, fix this or else. Back in Antarctica, the Fisher King laughs, telling Manta that he must think by joining Nemo that he may have a say in how things work. However, Nemo's agenda has been set for decades. Everything we've done, will do, is a carefully structured program of global manipulation. No newcomer, however talented he is, will come with radical ideas and disrupt our intricately designed program. You could be an asset to us, but you will be an instrument. Manta says that he's never served under anyone, and the Fisher King tells him, get used to it. With a sudden lunge, Manta slices the Fisher King's throat, and Blackjack shouts, what the hell? are you doing? And Manta takes the throne, telling her, Long live the king. Any questions? Back over in the Atlantic. As Arthur and Mera head back to Atlantis, Mera asks if he was really just threatened by Superman. And Arthur tells her, yes. She asks if Superman was serious. And Arthur tells her, absolutely. It means that I really have to fix this. Mera was sent off to be approved to become Aquaman's official queen with the elders, and he awoke early that morning complaining that his bed was too big and empty. The guard explains that it'll only be a few months until Mera returns, but uh, that doesn't sit well with Arthur for rather obvious reasons. But he has other concerns right now as the Drift, his special forces unit, report that there is some seismic activity approaching Atlantis, Black Manta's secret weapon. Arthur approaches the beast with the Drift and he begins to ask what it wants and if they can help. And it responds by clobbering him and throwing him back. He literally goes flying through the rocks on the seafloor. Neptune's balls, the leader of the Drift says, and he begins to open fire on the creature. They get in closer to see if they kill it, but they see their wounds healing and it throws back one of the Drift members. Scared of what it's going to do next, they watch as Arthur swims back in, slamming the creature with his trident. You will stop. It throws him aside again and he watches as the trident wound heals, so he shoves it in deeper. The monster begins throwing the Drift and Arthur around and then it walks into Atlantis, destroying everything in its path. Black Manta demands a report asking, as the creature succeeded and his subordinate tells him, the creature has reached Atlantis. Has he even slowed it down? Not at all, sir. 
As the creature attacks Atlantis, Tula leaves her role as regent and joins the fight, but as the creature goes to smash in her head, the king swims in saving her. For God's sake, Tula, you have responsibilities now. I know, your highness, I summon the fleet. The war fleet positions itself and they're scared to open fire into the city, so she calls down a precision laser strike right on the creature. Everyone looks into the crater, and that's when Arthur sees that his enemy is the Shaggy Man. It's a synthetic, regenerating killing machine built by the surface dwellers that took the entire Justice League to a standstill in the past. Arthur leaves in, swinging his trident again, and Tula asks him, How will you stop the unstoppable? I'm working on that! He says as he keeps dodging and swinging, and he asks where it's heading. Where is its path going? And they report that the Shaggy Man will reach the coast in nine minutes and destroy his surface home of MSD Bay. Arthur tries to pull the fleet in to block the Shaggy Man, but he leaves past all of them and straight out of the ocean landing at Amnesty Bay, Arthur's main homeland town. He then begins throwing cars around as Arthur begins to swim at his top speed to catch up. The Drifts tell him to slow down as they can't keep up with him at his top speed, but he tells them it's MSD Bay, and Merc, the leader of the Drift, tells him, exactly, that's the surface dweller's problem now. Arthur ignores that. I'll pretend I didn't hear you say that, Merc. It's my home, as much as Atlantis is yours. Tula dials in, telling him that the Warfleet is ready to assist him, but Arthur tells her no. If the Warfleet goes to the surface for whatever the reason, the American government will assume it's an act of war. He rockets out of the ocean prepared to continue this. Meanwhile, Mera is still with the elders as they run her through the trials, to which she isn't happy with. Arthur leaps onto the monster and is thrown aside again. Then the Shaggy Man throws cars on top of him, burying him. He quickly grabs the civilians in the way and he pushes them out of the path of the Shaggy Man as he continues smashing everything in front of him. And again, he takes a major hit to the chest, throwing him to the ground. As he gets up swinging, that's when Merc jumps in to grab him and pull him aside. Call your friends, Arthur! Call the damn Justice League! But Arthur shrugs it off. As a matter of fact, what kind of heroes are they? They should want to save this town with you involved or not. But then he realizes why Arthur hasn't made the call. It's his pride. Arthur doesn't want to call him. You want to prove to the world that you can do this on your own. Merc. Tell me I'm wrong. Tell me you aren't tired of being that other guy behind Superman. You are out of line, Commander. And you're out of your mind, Lord King. You have nothing to prove, sir. You are Aquaman by the gods. And Arthur leaps in to keep fighting. Yes, I am. He jumps right onto the Shaggy Man and he sends out a command. Justice League Satellite. Voice Authority Arthur Curry. Initiate teleport lock. And he shoves his Justice League tracking beacon into the Shaggy Man's air. Override transfer safety. Set transport range to maximum. And the Shaggy Man slams him into the ground. Activate! In a flash of light, the satellite grabs the card and it teleports the target into the middle of space, where it angrily yells out. Arthur tries to hold himself up with his trident, but he falls back to the ground in a pool of his own blood. Merc runs over shouting, Help! Somebody help me! Somebody! But no one answers. To make matters worse, Mera just received word that she will not be trained to become the queen, because as the Elder's prophecy states, the king will fall and the queen in her grief will become the fatal queen and end the world. Mera, furious that they would say this, swims off to figure this out, knowing it has to be false, and then she hears her king has fallen in battle. While Arthur continues to maintain his innocence and prove to the world that Atlantis can be a nation to be trusted, Black Manta begins to plan Nemo's next move. Publicly, the world still sees Arthur as a hero, with citizens and fellow Justice League members vouching for him. As the news reports go on, Blackjack asks Manta what are they going to do next, go public? And Manta tells her no. Controlling the world in secret is one of Nemo's greatest weapons. Right now, Atlantis is about to declare war on the United States, and it's going to be a global disaster. Manta then tells Blackjack to ready the pretender units. This next mission is going to be a false flag operation. Meanwhile, back in Atlantis, Joanna Stubbs tells Arthur that she may have an idea as to who is staging these attacks. After joining the Royal Navy, her father came to her and tried to recruit her for something called Nemo. She goes on saying how her father explained that they have their roots worldwide and that they were the ones who staged the attack, framing Atlantis as the aggressors. The next morning, the news stations across the nation began to report that there had been large-scale attacks against several East Coast locations. It seems that Atlantis has launched an unprovoked military assault on the United States. Meanwhile in Atlantis, Arthur watches as the video feeds show Atlantean soldiers announcing in the name of Atlantis, the deluge sweeps you away. As the attacks on the coast continue, President Obama makes an announcement to the American people that they are currently under assault by the Atlantean nation. As of now, their military forces have been mobilized and with great regret, he must say that now, they are currently at war with Atlantis. Arthur watches the news and he turns back asking his counsel one question. 
Is that actually us? The three military commanders all say that their units are all here and accounted for, so Arthur tells them, Get our military ready. We are not fighting in a war. We are defending against it. Kachardor then says that there's an incoming message from Captain Orkos. Orkos says that the scans show a warship holding position 200 miles east of New York. The sensors show that the ship is the Megalodon, a Sea Fury class war merciful destroyer. Chitardor mentions that the ship disappeared 35 years ago, and Arthur says, well, it seems like someone recovered it and they're now using it to stage a war in the name of Atlantis. Orkos says that if the command is given, he will be within firing range of the Megalodon within 13 minutes. But before Arthur can answer, Orkos shouts that they've been pinged by the American warships. They're planning on attack. Arthur watches as an explosion goes off in the video feed and then silence. He turns back to his council and he tells them to mobilize the defense fleet. We are to defend our territory only, only attacking if we are attacked first. Tula then tells the council that they heard their king move out. Kai calls Arthur over before leaving and he tells him that he's been trying to make contact with the United States in order to cease fire, but they are ignoring Atlantis. Arthur tells him to just keep trying. And meanwhile, over at the White House, the chief of staff, Gantry, is told by Admiral Meddinghouse that their preparations are complete. He would like to introduce them to the team that will be infiltrating the Atlantean territory. Gantry then asks what exactly are these people supposed to do? And Meddinghouse takes a gun from one of the guards and fires it at one of his soldiers. The female soldier, Rhonda, takes out her hand, catching the bullet, and tells Gantry that they should see their combat form if he thought that was cool. Later, back in Atlantis, Arthur and Mara sit with Joanna, trying to see if there is any more information regarding her father or Nemo. She tells them that she wasn't aware of any tech that can manipulate water, but her father said that Nemo had a functional control over the seas. Arthur says that he's going to catch one of those pretender agents then, and find out exactly what Nemo is capable of. But as he leaves, Mara stops him, telling him that with everything going on, she can no longer be a part of this. Do not ask for her assistance. Arthur tries to stop and understand, but before he can even ask what's going on, Mara quickly switches swims off. Back on the surface, the pretend attackers begin to get more aggressive, and all the while, Black Manta watches, and he smiles. Manta asks if anyone's been captured yet, and Blackjack says no. So he pushes a button and tells her that that's good, because they know what would happen if someone were to get captured. Back in Atlantis, Tula begins to finish her preparations for her defenses when there's a sudden voice calling out to Arthur. He looks up to see Clark and the rest of the League, and Clark tells him, we gave you a chance, Arthur. As the League stands there, Arthur tells them, if you're here to help, then help. Atlantis is not at war with the surface, but someone is making it look like we are. Clark asks him if he's really sticking to that story. And Arthur tells him, it's Nemo. They have massive resources and they are old. They're an invisible world power. Batman asks if he has any evidence and Arthur responds with, what? Is it because my word isn't good enough? I completely trust you, but you could have been misled. I do have evidence, but I need a negotiator for the White House. The room falls silent and after sighing, Clark tells him, show me what you have. Meanwhile, back at Commander Stubb's sub, Control advises that they have an Atlantean war merciful closing in on their location. Stubbs gives the order to prime the railgun. The Atlanteans are about to have a rude awakening when they see Nemo's weapon tech. Over at Chichardor's ship, Chichardor asks Tula if they can engage. The U.S. ships are crossing into their territory. Tula tells her to stand down, but suddenly a beam shoots through the warship. Elsewhere, Mara sits in her room asking Mother Kita if this is what they prophesized about. Kita says that the Widowhood has warned her and she laughed. Now she believes them that Arthur will fall and Mera will bring the destruction of Atlantis? Mera says that the prophecy said the king would fall and the queen would become the world's end harbinger. But Arthur lives and they are yet to be married, so she really can't do that. Sita stops her, telling her that she has bought it with the king, as if she would be his queen. The only choice here is to do nothing. Mera shouts that she wants to help Arthur. Their world will be dying! And Sita stops her again, telling her that the king does not need the fatal queen. For their sake, she must be absent. Meanwhile, back at the control room, Batman reads over the data collected by Roa. He says that it's all very compelling. It shows how Atlantean weapons and hardware have been procured to give authenticity to the imposters. Great detective work. Arthur tells Roa that that's going to be the greatest compliment that she will ever receive. Clark steps in telling him that that data is going to help, but it does not show them who Nemo is or where they are. Arthur tells him it's still a work in progress, but as the two of them go on, Tula rushes in advising that they are currently under attack. Chachardor's ship is down. Arthur shouts for Clark to go. He needs to protect his city. And out in the city, the buildings begin to fall as Stubbs continues his attack. Arthur shoots through the waters to Stubbs' sub, and he begins to rip his way into it. As the waters begin to flood, Arthur grabs a hold of Stubbs, telling him, Nemo is about to tell the truth to the world once I'm done with you. Stubbs laughs, telling him, You've never really grasped what's at stake here, huh? Back at the Nemo command, Blackjack says that their objective is complete. There is significant damage to Atlantis, but Stubbs and his crew have been taken alive. Manta holds up a button and he presses it, and a sound begins to pulse 
into Stubbs' brain and suddenly his head is torn apart by Coral. Over at the White House, Meddinghouse tells Gantry that it's nice that the Justice League brought some data to try and help Atlantis, but they could easily be defending another of their members. Gantry tells him, fine, go ahead and do it. And elsewhere, Rhonda tells the squad that they've just received their orders. They are going in for the kill. Seconds later, all six Aquamarines shoot out of the water, all transformed into their battle armor sea creature modes. Rhonda tells everyone that it's time to go kill a king. Back in Atlantis, Joanna looks over the dead bodies recovered from the recent attack, and she recognizes the commander, Mike Stubbs. Her father, the one who tried to recruit her. Roa says as far as they can tell, the radio pulse triggered pellets of a fast-growing coral that has been surgically implanted into their brains. As you can see, the results are catastrophic. Arthur tells her to continue with her analysis. For now, he's going to make sure that everything else is okay. A short while later, Arthur heads over to the council room to advise that they are continuing to not attack the American troops. Neil tells him that there is no appeasement. America will continue their assault and never show kinship towards them. Koa says that's right. What they need right now is a strong leader who... But Arthur stops and asks, do you question my ability as king? Neil tries to tell him that that's not what he meant, but then his words trail off as he looks into the distance. Suddenly, gunfire shoots into a crowd and the Aquamarines begin to swim in. Kai tells Arthur to hurry up and leave, and as he does, he's shot in the back. After taking out the rest of the council, Rhonda tells everyone to spread out and search. One of the Aquamarines begins to swim off, and Arthur crashes into the wall, punching him down! He then rockets himself towards the others, but the Octopus Marine grabs him by the neck! Rhonda swims in, grabbing Arthur, shouting for him to go for the kill shot. But before they can, a giant and watery shot is punching them away. With the watery arm, Mera rises and begins to take down the other Marines. Arthur struggles with Rhonda telling Mera that he has their leader. Rhonda begins to pull away, slashing at Arthur's face, and just as she goes down to bite him, Arthur punches her back, pushing her away. Suddenly, a giant sea creature opens its mouth to bite down on Rhonda, but instead Arthur tells it to not eat her. He then punches Rhonda, knocking her out, telling her that there will be no more death today. A little while later, as Arthur recovers, Mera says that Neol and Ko have been slain from that last attack. Kai is also injured and is currently in critical state. But while thinking back on it, Arthur asks Bice when he brought the sea monster with him. He was using a staff to control it. Bice tells him that's right. It's just a sore rider's mind goad to keep them in check. Arthur looks at the Mind Goad, stating that it has a short-range Aqua Telepathis Blast, an artificial version of his power. But the pulse it gave is like the one that he felt when Joanna's father was killed. Roa steps in, stating that Nemo can duplicate their Atlantean gifts. She should be able to track where that signal originated from. As Roa leaves, Arthur sits down on his throne and he makes a broadcast to everyone of Atlantis. He tells them that what they are hearing is true. The Americans tried to assassinate him in the palace. He knows many Atlanteans want to vengeance, but that isn't what they need. With his last words, the great Koa, Elder of Law, says that he feared that their king may not be strong enough to lead. So with that, there will be one last effort to halt the war with the surface. And if he shall fail, he will accept the idea that peace is foolish and he will step away from the throne. As the broadcast ends, Mera asks if he's serious and Arthur tells her. Never more serious. Well, maybe when I asked you to marry me. Mara says they need to talk. It's about the widowhood and what they prophesized. But before Arthur can ask, Roa returns with the data, and Arthur just tells Mara that he loves her. After reading the location, Arthur shoots out of Atlantis, and a short while later he reaches Panta da Alta, the Azores. The doors to the Manta ship burst open as Arthur flies in and he sees Black Manta and he says, This all makes a whole lot more sense now. Blackjack shouts back, How did you find us? But without saying a word, Arthur begins to attack everyone. Manta fights back saying, Us meeting like this, it all goes back around. But this time, Arthur punches him away telling him, I no longer have an interest in talking. He turns back tearing through Blackjack and the other guards and just as he gains an upper hand, Manta jumps from behind choking Arthur. As the two of them begin to struggle, Arthur manages to elbow Manta and kick him away. Manta then blasts him with his helmet, and Arthur throws his trident into Manta's shoulder, tackling him through the ship's walls. The two go back and forth, punching each other, and through their punches, Arthur grabs Manta, telling him, you have no one to blame but yourself. Manta pulls out a device, telling him, it's going to be a hell of a place for both of us, and he presses the button. The entire ship explodes, and through the flames of the burning ship, Arthur rises alive. A short while later, Arthur gives his statement stating that the Atlantean special forces are combing through the wreckage searching for Manta's body. But as of now, Nemo is disabled. The war between Atlantis and America is done because the true aggressor has left the field. Arthur then drops Manta's broken helmet on the desk, telling them that he thought that they should be face to face and point out that if he wanted him dead, he would be so five minutes ago. Gantry shouts, Mr. Curry! But Arthur tells him, I am not addressing you. If you want to speak to me, do so with respect by stating your majesty. Arthur goes back to President Obama, telling him, Once again, if I really wanted you dead, it would have been done. But that is not who I or Atlantis are. President Obama asks, Are you finished? 
Your Majesty? Arthur continues telling him, What happened were the actions of a third party, and I am here to tell you that I will be the loser here. Atlantis loses right now. And so a public statement is then broadcast around the world as President Obama announces the war between Atlantis and the United States has ended. It is evident that a third party played a role in engineering the conflict. Mira watches and tells Sita that it's over, but Sita says yes, stability is restored, but for how long? Meanwhile, back on the coasts of Azores, through the wreckage of their ship, Blackjack crawls her way to the shore. With efforts now focused on bringing peace to the people of Atlantis and the world, Aquaman Arthur Curry visits the headquarters of the United Nations in Manhattan. As Arthur jumps down, Secret Service agent Fellner says that they could have just sent a car to come pick him up, and Arthur tells him, It's fine, I, uh, just jumped here. Though I appreciate it, there is also no need for security. Fellner says that he is a visiting head of state, royalty no less, so the state will give him security either way. As everyone heads inside, Fellner begins to explain the day's events, but partly into it, Arthur begins to hear a loud humming noise. Fellner notices Arthur trailing off and he asks if everything's okay, and Arthur says that unless the Secret Service is using telepathy instead of the old earbuds, then he is fine. Once inside before the UN, Arthur takes the stand and he tells everyone his name is Arthur Curry, and on behalf of the nation of Atlantis, he stands here in the name of peace and... But before he can continue, Arthur sees a soldier standing in front of him, talking, but no words are coming out. The audience all begins to murmur, asking what's going on, and Arthur snaps out of his vision, and he continues on with his speech. As the meeting concludes, Mara calls out to Arthur, telling him that that went well, and he tells her, yeah, he feels somewhat recognized now, like he's seen as a force of good and not a monster. Mara says, of course, he worked hard for all of that to come together, but what was that hesitation at the start? Arthur tells her that it was just nerves and he'll call her back later. Fellner takes back the phone telling Arthur that it was a good speech. Now there is a press call in two hours that they must go to and... But as Fellner talks, Arthur begins to see that soldier from before again, still trying to talk. He asks if anyone else is seeing that and all of the agents say that they don't see anything. He then takes out his trident to amplify his telepathy and he asks the man, Who are you? And what do you want? The soldier begins to run, and as Arthur gives chase, Fellner grabs him by the shoulder, telling him that he can't leave. Arthur reaches back, forcibly removing Fellner's grasp, telling him that he doesn't expect him to understand, but he has to go now. As Arthur jumps off, Fellner radios in that the fish stick has gone into rogue condition. Repeat, rogue condition. Over in another part of the city, Arthur lands and he calls out to the soldier, and this time, he turns back and he tells Arthur, Please, no more. Arthur looks around and he sees a war zone, and then it fades back to normal and he asks, what did I just see? A civilian then calls out to Arthur, telling him that he's sorry. He has zero control over his body right now, please! When Arthur looks at the man, the civilian is standing there with a shotgun pointed right at him, and it goes off! As the smoke clears from Arthur's chest, he smacks the gun down and he stomps on it, asking, Where is he? The man struggles, telling him that he's downstairs in the lab. Arthur rushes inside to find another possessed civilian. But after stopping him, the man says that the person called himself Warhead. He's like a deranged robot. Suddenly, the humming can be heard again, and Arthur calls out, asking, What is it? What is wrong? I can feel you. It's like you're calling out for help, but attacking instead. After getting further inside, Arthur finds Warhead, and as they fight, he, through telepathy, asks, What is it that he wants? Why is he doing this? Warhead doesn't say anything, and then he reaches out, grabbing Arthur by the head, changing his vision. As Arthur gets back up, he sees the war zone again, the explosions all going off around him, and they throw him! Arthur gets back up, stating, This isn't another projection. Oh god, this is real! Not long after, the Secret Service rush into the building after Arthur, and Fellner bangs on the door, telling Arthur to open it up and come out. Arthur hears the voices and he tells them, he's, he's not really here. The more Arthur looks around, he sees that he's in a war zone in Kondok. It feels too real, but it's not. Suddenly, the soldiers run by shouting to please stop attacking. They've surrendered, so there's no need to fight any longer. And as the images of the men begin to crumble, Warhead appears telling them, victory was achieved. Arthur shouts, thank God you can speak. What is all of this about? Warhead continues, victory was achieved. However, Kandaki military advisors ordered me to continue with the extermination of all Balin elements. Arthur asks, You refused? A piece of military hardware refusing an order? Is it because you are sick of killing? And the warhead speaks again. There was no strategic value in continued persecution. It was purely vengeance. Vengeance is wrong. Warhead then punches Arthur, telling him, you are receptive to contact, but resistant to control. You will give me control. Arthur starts fighting back, asking why. I don't have to fight you. Just tell me what happened after you refused the order. 
The room begins to change again and Arthur sees the Kandaki military and the commanding officer shouting for them to disconnect the disobedient thing. As the soldiers do, one begins shooting into the back of Warhead's head and Arthur says that they damaged him. Warhead swings again at Arthur, telling him, An element of damage. I am instructed to retreat to a secure location to perform diagnostics and repair. However, there is no place that is secure. As the two struggle back and forth, Warhead goes on, saying, There is something that woke me from repair mode. And then the room changes again. Arthur watches the time when the Nemo suicide trigger went off, and he says that's it. If that war is over, there is no more threat from that, so please let me help you. Warhead tells him, this location is inadequate in resources to provide comprehensive military protection. I must control a more sophisticated military resource. Arthur tells him, Wait, you want to take control of Atlantis? The room begins to change again and Warhead continues explaining. Evaluation shows that it is the best option. Significant advanced technology. Significant military resources. I would be safe there. Secure. Nothing could harm me ever again. Arthur tells him that his nation does possess great power, but they hold it in check. He just stopped a war to prove that. Warhead reaches out to Arthur, telling him, If you will not comply, I will be forced to secure my needs by direct means. Arthur turns back, punching Warhead in the head, telling him that he can't let him do that. And as the two begin to fight, Arthur shouts that he knows that he isn't just a machine. There's a human mind inside of there, and it's hurt. You have PTSD. You just want to feel safe again, and nothing is letting you. Arthur then has Warhead hold the trident, and he tells him, Look, see which would be a real threat. Warhead's vision begins to change, and he sees himself in control of the Atlantis army. But everywhere is destruction. Arthur goes on, telling him, I know you're hurt and scared, but don't become one of the many threats that you see. Let me help you. I'll provide you a place of asylum, somewhere to heal, but the technopathic abilities must be shut down. Warhead's eyes begin to lose their glow, and he tells him, I comply. Arthur helps Warhead up, and he asks him, What was your name originally? And he tells him, See you. Then See you says, Arthur Curry, when our minds were connected, you saw something. Arthur tells him, Yeah, I did. I saw all of the people in the world who see you as a possible threat and that they don't trust you. I saw myself as others see me, and it just made me fear myself, which is very disappointing. Moments later, Felner knocks the door in, and Arthur tells them that he'll be taking See You back with him to Atlantis. Felner says that there are so many issues with that, and Arthur tells him, good, we can skip all of that. Later, as Arthur returns to his home in Amnesty Bay, Mara and the others welcome Arthur back, but Mara says that there's someone here to see him. Arthur asks who it could be, and then he sees Rhonda Ryoke of the Aquamarines. Rhonda says that she trusts that he can overlook the unannounced visit, and before, it was a military operation. However, in the spirit of cooperation between nations, the United States needs his help. Right now. Arthur asks, with what? And Rhonda tells him, dead water. They are as silent as Arthur and Mera ride in a helicopter with Major Rhonda Rico and Specialist Marcel Ali of the Aquamarines. It is in that silence that Arthur thinks back to things just before they boarded this flight, and how Mera was stating that the Aquamarines did just try to assassinate him in our previous story. The link to that will be down below. However, it was because America had come asking for help that Arthur agreed. This is the recognition that they've been working so hard for, that Atlantis can work with the US government. And Mara told him that though she agrees, they must find out why the strange water had transformed pain. The only way that she will allow this is if she comes with them. After Mara's reluctant approval, Rhonda explained their current situation, thinking that they may have found the source of the strange water. Peter Mortimer, otherwise known as the Scavenger, finally woke up from his coma a week prior, and he revealed the location of the U.S. Navy research base that had been studying a sinkhole. Two days ago, the Velez base went dark, and their first objective was to safeguard the personnel and then investigate and determine the strange water threat. Once the helicopter was in position, Rhonda tells Marcel that it's time to shark up, and they turn on their aquamarine abilities as they jump into the ocean below. As they reach the shore, the four meet up with the rest of the aquamarines, Dean, Adrian, and Gary. The group moves through the woods, and Dean reports to Rhonda that they're ready to move on her go, though Wilkes is up ahead babysitting their other guests. Arthur asks, what do you mean by the other guests? And once they come out of the brush, Corey walks up with the FBI agents, Ajar and Irving, along with Peter. Arthur looks at Peter asking, why did you bring him? And Peter asks, do you think I want to be here? After what that freak did to me? Arthur tells him that the creature is dead. We're simply here to discover what created it. And Dean pulls Arthur aside, saying that the brief said that Peter there was the one who encountered the strange water stuff. And Arthur says, yeah, during an illegal salvage operation. 
One of his crewmen, Jonah Payne, came in contact with the substance and later became known as the monster Dead Water. Though they managed to stop the rampage that left 13 dead, Payne didn't survive, and now they must learn what did that to him. As the team gets ready to enter the base, Arthur scans the levels below and Dean asks what exactly is the strange water stuff that they're looking for. Arthur tells him it's hard to say. I could usually read all types of water, but this one is unique, older, odder, almost alien. It has some peculiar properties, couldn't breathe in it, and it's doubtful any Atlantean could. It had a sort of otherness that made it feel almost sentient. Once the team enters the base, they split up to look for the 30 missing workers, but no matter where they look, they find nothing. In one of the labs, Ajar notices that the containers are filled with different kinds of odd-looking fish and asks Mara if she's ever seen anything like those before. Mara says no, not in a million years. Those creatures have not been alive on Earth since the Devion period. Irving pulls out a report stating that that's funny, but it shows that the specimen here was recovered from the bottom of a lagoon in the last three weeks, alive. At another part of the facility, Gary notices a half-made device. He says that he's not sure what it is, but someone is trying to build something in a hurry. Rhonda asks if it could be a jamming device, maybe something that could explain the radio silence, but Arthur says that that can't be it. It was never finished. Everyone begins checking in with their reports, and one by one, they all say that they have no signs of anything. And just before Marcel checks off, Deadwater appears in the bathrooms. The team quickly rushes to where Marcel was, and as they enter, they see that it's already too late for Marcel. Rhonda opens fire, but her bullets pass through, not slowing down Deadwater. Deadwater jumps over at Arthur and into the puddle of water and then vanishes. Dead water is a creature that has the ability to escape using any source of water around them. Arthur Curry, aka Aquaman, did fight it in one of our earlier videos and I'll link it down below. Rhonda stares for a moment and then she looks at the puddle. It is no deeper than a millimeter. She radios back to the others to inform them of what happened and then a panic begins to come over Peter as a rumbling comes out of the shelf. One of the glass containers shatters, and out of the water, Deadwater springs out to attack. Mara tries to fight it, but Deadwater just knocks her away. And then there's a booming sound coming from the wall as Arthur bursts in shouting to Deadwater, Your killing spree ends here! But as Arthur begins to battle dead water, he knows that he can't effectively do anything against it, and he yells to Mara, Drain all the water! Drive the water out of the lab! Just then, all of the water and the moisture is sucked out of the air and sent outside of the facility, forcing dead water to retreat. He jumps into a hole in the wall, and Arthur blocks it, telling Mara, Go ahead and extend your powers. Remove all water from within the base. Mara's abilities are hydrotelekinesis. She can manipulate and move any water source near her. Rhonda tells Dean to go ahead and have everyone lock down all of the access points and make a perimeter fast. Arthur checks on everyone and Ajar says that she had forgotten how terrifying that thing was. And Peter shouts asking, I thought you killed the damn thing. Arthur tells him that Jonah is dead. There must be another dead water. And Peter yells back telling him that he's not okay with this. We have to extract it now. You said it was supposed to be safe here. Once everyone calms down, Arthur takes a look at the only lead that they have, the half-completed device. As he inspects it, Arthur says that he thought it was a jamming device of sorts, but now it appears to be a shield, a rather crude version of an aqua telepathic goad that Atlantis uses to control the sea creatures. Irving asks if it can generate a field, what is it supposed to be keeping out? And Arthur says that his guess would be dead water. But perhaps if someone was skilled in dissecting Atlantean technology, and Peter asks him, what, you? Arthur tells him that he should already have some idea of how the goads work. He's already stolen enough of them as a scavenger. While the perimeter is set, Corey radios in quietly stating, Major? And Rhonda asks why is he whispering, and Corey tells her that it's because the damn thing is right behind him. He's gonna need some assistance. As he transforms into his aquamarine form, his shark form, everyone else begins to move to his location, following the loud thumping sounds. As everyone turns the corner, Deadwater throws Corey through the wall, and he gets ready to tear into him. Back in the lab, Arthur tells Peter, Whatever you're doing, power up that shield now! Peter sighs, telling him this better work. And then he hits the switch, and a blue light begins to spread throughout the facility and onto dead water. It screams out in pain as it flails around on the floor, and it slowly begins to revert back to its original form, a human form. The man coughs, trying to pick himself up, but Dean charges forward, opening fire on the man. Later, as Corey receives medical attention, a jar pulls out paperwork stating that the idea has been confirmed. Lawrence Quinn, one of the scientists assigned to the base, one of the people that they were supposed to be rescuing. Mara turns to Dean, and Dean tells everyone, don't look at me. That guy was dead water, and he just tore up Corey. While everyone argues the moral judgment of shooting an unarmed man, Arthur stops everyone stating that they came here to do something and they will see to it. 
Him and Mara will swim down into the sinkhole to investigate, but they're going to need scuba gear since they can't breathe that otherworldly strange water. A short while later, Arthur and Mara are swimming down to the bottom of the lagoon. But back inside, the aquamarines finish bringing up the last of their supplies, and as Peter looks at the cases, he says, Please don't tell me that that's an M390 mini nuke. Dean laughs, ha <laughs> ha, what if it is? And Peter says, give me one good reason as to why you're not using it right now. Before he can answer though, Irving interrupts stating that she just checked the reports. Quinn was a biologist, however, he was not dive rated. Rhonda asks what that's supposed to mean and Irving explains that he couldn't have descended into the sinkhole. It's not the immersion of the H2O that turns people into dead water, it's something else. Ajar then says that she also did some tests. Water samples from the lagoon are heavy with organic fiber. Rhonda asks what kind and Ajar tells her human tissue atomized. The concentration suggests that she just found the rest of the base crew, the other 29 people. Back down in the lagoon, Arthur and Mara swim deeper into the sinkhole, and Mara asks what is that? Arthur looks at the fissure and he says that he sees it too, but he just doesn't know what it is. Up in the base, everyone tries to get in contact with Arthur, but all signals come back as dead air. And down below, Arthur begins to feel a pulse from the sinkhole, asking Mara if she felt it as well. She tells him no, and he tells her that it's an aqua telepathic thing then, and it feels sentient. She begins to move through the water, stating that this H2O is surrounding them, but it behaves rather curiously, like its essential properties are different. Arthur says that he feels a desperate urge to turn around and flee, and Mara tells him that she can imagine that his aqua telepathy is making him more susceptible to this. They have to press on. Arthur tells her that she's right, of course. They should check the gate. And Mara asks, why did you just call it that? Arthur tells her that he doesn't know why. All he knows is that it just felt right, and now it is time for them to go, together, into it. Up top, panic begins to set in between Ajar and Peter, and Peter shouts that they should just go ahead and end this whole thing now. Rhonda tells everyone that she's going to be crystal clear about this. The deployment of that device is the ultimate fallback. She will only consider using it in the event of a confirmed Alpha class threat, but currently they are nowhere near that. She then transforms into her shark form, telling everyone, now you all just need to calm the hell down and get a grip. Adrian breaks the silence, stating that he's got something. He's gonna try boosting the signal again. Static begins to come through and bits of Arthur's words can be heard. He says that they have located a gateway, like a portal, and it seems to be a scaled up version of what Deadwater used. Mara and him are going to swim through it now, and Rhonda asks where does that portal lead? But Arthur tells her that he can't say for sure, but it's not anywhere on this planet. As Arthur and Mara swim through, Arthur feels something and says that this place is called the Tethys. The aqua telepathic link is stronger here. The Tethys is an ocean world, a whole world of sentient water. As they look around, Amara asks if they're in any sort of danger, and Arthur says no, it's not hostile, it's been waiting. Waiting for life forms to pass its test and make contact, which is why they must press on. She then asks what it did with those that failed. Arthur tells her that that was the pulse, a defense mechanism. It generated fear in any intruders forcing them to turn back. However, if the intruder was persistent and kept going, the fear becomes too great and it turns them into dead water. Mara told him, wait. If the pulse can have that effect on anyone in its range, oh god, we have to return to the surface. Back up top, Adrian tries to reconnect with Arthur, but Ajar says they have a problem. Peter's missing. Everyone begins to search, and Dean says that it would seem that Peter has taken the mini nuke with him. As everyone separates to find him, Ajar finds him in a room alone with the nuke armed. Peter tells her that they have 30 minutes to get clear, but as Ajar screams that he's an idiot, she begins to feel a pain in her stomach. Peter asks her what's wrong, and as she comes back up, she transforms into dead water. As Peter shouts because dead water is attacking him, a jar throws him across the room, and soon everyone else runs towards the screams. Rhonda quickly jumps into battle while Dean pulls Peter away, and as he explains that the thing is a jar, his fears begin to set in. His face begins to change, and then he also turns into a dead water. The two begin tearing into the aquamarines, and then there's suddenly an explosion as Arthur and Mara crash in, telling everyone to get back. While Aquaman holds them off, Mara begins to suck the moisture out of the air, and it forces them all to retreat, just as the scientists did before. Once there's no sign of dead waters, everyone regroups and Aquaman says that they need to hurry and activate the shield. Rhonda then walks in stating about that. The device got smashed. Mara tells Arthur that they need to make contact with the Tethys. They have to have them shut down the signal so that Ajar and Peter can return to normal. Arthur says that it's possible, but they just don't know enough about the Tethys yet. And Mara stops him telling him that they can learn its ways later. Just make contact. You alone have that connection. 
Dean tells everyone that there's no time for that. The mini nuke is running. So Adrian runs over to cover up the nuke's controls. And he says that Peter jammed the safety lock when he rigged it. He can try to disarm it, but he can't guarantee anything. But as they're all trying to figure out what to do next, Ajar and Peter come smashing into the room again. Arthur shouts to Rana to go and get everyone out of here. He's going to handle this. And then he grabs the mini nuke and he jumps out of the facility. He lands in the ocean and just behind him, Mara dives in asking what his plan is. He tells her that he's blocking the signal. This is the only way to save both Ajar and Peter. And Mara tells him no. He can talk to the Tethys. He can make contact with it. Adrian can disarm the device. He takes a deep breath before swimming into the H2O and he says, we don't have time for possibilities. Please, go back. The blast radius will. But Mara yells, Neptune's teeth! You're mad! You're gonna kill yourself down there! Please, just talk to it! Make contact! Arthur swims faster, telling Mara that he's asking her to go back. Now! This is the only way to be sure! Soon he swims into the lagoon and he tosses the briefcase into the cracks. The mini nuke goes off and everyone on the surface sees both a jar and Peter returning to normal. Just as everyone wonders what happened to Arthur and Mara, a bubble flows to the top and it pops, releasing the two of them. Rhonda and the rest run into the water to help them and they ask how the hell they survived that. And Arthur coughs, stating that Mara made a hard water bubble that saved them both. How are a jar and Peter? Rhonda smiles, stating that they're okay. And Dean yells that that was one hell of a thing. But while everyone congratulates Arthur, Mara stares in disappointment. Later that night, as everything settles down, Mara tells Arthur that his American friends are pleased with the outcome. And Arthur begins to say that it was a judgment call. There was no time to. But she stops him, telling him, yes, you just kept on insisting. You abandoned diplomatic contact in favor of a violent response. You were faced with a mystery from the deep oceans, and rather than make a deal with the unknown, you used a weapon. You treated the Tethys in the same way the surface treats Atlantis, not even trying to understand it. Meanwhile, down in the penitentiary vaults of Atlantis, Coram Wrath sits in his cell and a light shines on him. He asks who it is and the voice tells him that they are the future and his hour has come. After the events of the Alchemarines, Arthur and Mera return to Atlantis to find that something is wrong. The sea is too quiet, like all life is mute. As the two make their way to the throne room, they find that it is empty as well. But Arthur tells Mera to stay close. He doesn't think that they are alone. The water begins to shift and Arthur sees the Atlantean warriors all appear out of their cloaking fields, being led by Corm Wrath. Mera shouts, what is it, the terrorists? The deluge? Are the traitors free? The king had you all locked in the jail cells to rot. Yourself fires a net at Mera, telling her that he is not their king. And as Arthur struggles with Wrath, he asks, what is this, a coup? Or is it just a plain old murder attempt? Wrath says it's hard to seize power from a man who does not wield it. Arthur manages to push Wrath back, yelling, fine, just murder me then. I've had enough of these extremist actions. Wrath pushes back, asking, really? But you're never here. You're too busy with your surface interests and your mouth breather friends. Mera breaks free from the net, telling Arthur that there is no talking to this man. A king does not need to justify his policies to an enemy of the state. But as the two go back and forth, Arthur knocks Wrath into the royal halls, telling him, there is no way that you can hope to beat me. Wrath picks himself back up, telling him, I doubt anyone in Atlantis is a match for you or this Abelian woman, but are you a match for Atlantis? Just as Mera asks what is he saying, Elder Liat tells her that what Wrath is saying is that his warriors were released by their authority. Meanwhile, down in the jail cell, Vokal floats in his cell, stating that it's been daybreak since the release. Are they free to go? And Crean says that he's not so sure. He's been here for eight years. The outside scares him. All that open water. What if this is just a test? Volko tells him that King Arthur would never have set these doors open whilst they lay locked within. However, there is none more loyal to King Arthur than he. For the vault to be flung open, danger faces their city. Over in the audience hall with the Council of Elders, Liat tells Arthur that the Council wants peace and security for their nation. Yet every day he seeks to draw them ever closer to their ancient enemy. Arthur shouts that the surface is not their enemies. Atlantis is doomed if it remains in blind isolation. The surface fears us. They fear our technology, power, and strangeness. Atlantis was once the foremost culture on Earth. It sank and detached itself and fell into a dark age. Atlantis deserves to take its place in the world once more, to be a part of the human race and... And Liat stops him, asking, is that what Atlantis wants? The surface has their wars, their poverty, the corrosion of culture. The people of Atlantis see these progressive ways as a blight to be avoided. Arthur tries to say that a king must make painful decisions, but Liat asks, what kind of king have you been? All you've done is brought us close to the end war with the American nation. Mara shouts that she can't believe any of this. Arthur is their king, the king, and they would challenge him? He has fought and risked his life for Atlantis. Wrath tells her that they have a great king, a king who put Atlantis first. Orm, out of respect for his elder brother, gave up his throne for Arthur. Mera turns to Reverend Mother Krita, looking for support, but Krita asks, when has Arthur ever needed their help? 
Though she thinks that Arthur is not an evil man, nor a thoughtless one, he races them ahead and drives the people to where they do not want to go. Even though he managed to stop a war, the surface now sees Atlantis as surrendering. And now, with the enemies surrounding them, all that it has done is made them look weaker. Creta then walks before the council and says that the king gave his word to his people. And the king's word is bond. It is law. And for that, he must stand down. Mera tries to hold Arthur back as he tries reaching for Wrath, shouting, For this man? He's the king that you all want? And Liat tells him, Orm is gone. The house of Atlan has ended. Corm Wrath represents the traditions that Atlantis values. But while Arthur and Wrath argue up in the balcony, Tula asks Merc, how can he just stand there? And Merc tells her that he serves Atlantis. Yes, he has come to admire Arthur Curry, despite every step that he has taken, but he is the commander of the Drift. He serves the king, whoever that may be. Later in Arthur's chambers, Arthur looks out of the ocean, stating that he knew it would be hard to drag Atlantis out of the Dark Ages. However, he is king, and he will fight for his throne to prove it. After more time passes with Arthur imprisoned, Mera asks if he remains that determined to fight this. Arthur asks where is Tula, and Mera says that she has already gone, broke her shackles, and fled. They could flee too, they could leave! He could just be Aquaman and Mera! Arthur and Mera. Arthur tells her that he can't. He can understand her anger, but she is not nearly as angry as he thought. Mera says that she does hate this, but this could be a chance for them, a new beginning. They have lives beyond this, a home in Amnesty Bay, one that she is quite fond of. He has his role as Aquaman. The surface at least needs him. They can be free of these responsibilities, of these backward traditions, of a culture trapped in the past. They can be together like they've always wanted. Isn't this their chance for happiness at last? And Arthur asks, so? You just want to go to Amnesty Bay? And Mero says, yes, now we can go. Marry according to surface custom and live and love. You once asked me to be your wife. Why not come and live with me in that world? And as Arthur stands there, he doesn't answer. And after a few moments of silence, Mera leaves telling him, I'll be at the lighthouse. Later at the Great Hall of Atlantis, Elder Liot calls a meeting for those of Atlantis to announce their decision. They have weighed and debated on this grave matter. They have considered his worthiness to be a ruler of this nation. Does the king wish to address his chamber before they deliver their ruling? Arthur tells everyone that he urges them not to seek his removal. He is the king that their nation needs. He has done nothing but serve Atlantis and he has fought for peace. Unless Atlantis engages with the surface nations and gains recognition as a vital power, then it will be lost. Liot says that they can see that he has not changed his position. Duly noted. Arthur, House of Atlan, the council has concluded that you are leading Atlantis down a dangerous path, a path which the people choose not to follow, and we anoint Corm Wrath as our monarch. Liot then stands asking Arthur, do you abide by our decision or will you fight against it? He looks at him and he asks, who the hell do you think I am? I am the king here! The moment Arthur moves, the Atlantean guards all grab a hold of him and Merc tells him for Neptune's sake, just submit, don't make them. But before Merc can finish, Arthur breaks free to escape and Liot continues with the ceremony. He places the crown upon Corm Wrath's head and he says that the house of Atlan has ended. The house of Wrath now rises. Wrath stands stating to summon the silent school for his first act to safeguard their nation. He will isolate it from the surface enemies. Magisters, release the crown of thorns from the silent armories. Raise it to uncurl and protect our state. At that moment, the thorns begin to grow from the ground surrounding Atlantis. Over in Amnesty Bay, Tula asks, what do they do? Do they just wait? And Mara stands on the shore stating that he will come. She knows that he is stubborn, which is a quality that she has come to love most about him. He will rage at the elders. He will tell them in unflinching terms what fools they are being. And that will be his last act as a king. As the two talk, there's a loud booming sound and a pillar of purple light appears over where Atlantis sits. Back in the city, Arthur swims up where the thorns are getting ready to meet. And as Mera rushes down to try and help him, he reaches out and Merc cuts into Arthur, telling him, I have no pleasure in this business. Mera screams for Arthur as she tries to fight through the thorns, but all she can do is watch as Arthur's body sinks. The crown of thorns has isolated Atlantis from the rest of the world. Wrath takes his place on the royal throne and calls on Atlantis' most trusted advisors to gather. He tells them that his name is Coram Wrath of the House of Wrath, King of Atlantis, and his word is law. He wants that fact to be made clear to all of the royal court. He will not be weak like the prior king. That half-breed had too much of the surface in his blood. Atlantis was once the greatest and most advanced culture in the planet, and they shall be it again. Restoring their nation will not be accomplished in a single day. Drift Commander Ursel smiles, stating that at least they have made a good beginning, thanks to the diligence of Commander Merc and the Royal Guard. Wrath then tells Elder Leot that they must clean house and rebuild. Those sympathetic to the old king must be rooted out, along with those that are not true Atlanteans, those that have said to have had mutations. Ursel steps forward stating that such undesirables will be found. The drift hunts for them systematically. 
Leot brings up a screen stating that the Ninth Tried, in particular, is a nest of undesirables. Unlawful artifacts are common in those streets, though he knows that the district is not especially dear to the King's heart. Wrath takes off his helmet, stating that he was born and bred there, but rest assured, he has eyes and ears in that zone. The Ninth Tried is literally the lowest quarter of the city-state. The people of the Ninth Tried refer to themselves as Hadaline, the word for the organisms of the sunless zone that live off the organic matter sinking from above. The word began as a slur, but now they say it with pride. The Hadalines spend their time repairing the damage done during the last attack on Atlantis, and among them is a nameless man working tirelessly as one of them. No one talks to him, for he knows no one. No friends or acquaintances, just another illiterate who has come to the Ninth for work. The Ninth Tried is a sanctuary for those undesirables, but because it is a place where the sun doesn't touch, the crime lords typically have their gangs patrolling the streets. As one of the enforcers swims by, he notices the recluse of a man in the shadows and he calls to him asking, why does he hide? The man says because the light hurts his eyes, and the hooded enforcer then asks, Do you have any coins or trinkets of value, old things, from before the sinking? The man tells him that he has nothing, and the enforcer calls him, Worthless! I will gut you where you stand, but your face seems so very... familiar. As the light is cast onto the man, he is revealed to be Arthur Curry. However, Arthur tells the Enforcer that his name is Orin. The Enforcer pulls out his weapon, stating that he doesn't like the look of him, but before he can live up to his promise, another Enforcer calls out to him that he got one. Arthur watches as the Enforcer puts away his weapon and swims off. It wasn't him that they were looking for, not this time. And why should they? Arthur Curry, aka Aquaman, has been dead for weeks. Meanwhile, at the lighthouse in Amnesty Bay, Tula tells the sulking Mara that she needs to eat something. She doesn't eat, she doesn't sleep, she doesn't even speak. What happened to Arthur was awful. She watched him die, but she must live on. Mara doesn't respond, and Tula grabs her, telling her to please talk. We're friends, right? I have to help you. Back down in the ninth, though, the enforcers from before surround a man as he yells that they can tell Crush that he has the payment. The hooded enforcer says sadly it's too late for them. Crush wants to make them an example. But just before the enforcers can strike the man down, hundreds of fish swim around the man. The fish begin to attack the enforcers, slamming their bodies into the cavern walls, and they make a makeshift cavern. The former royal elder Volko, who also happens to be down there, swims out asking what the devil is going on. The man from before says that it's the ghost of the dead king coming back to protect them. He is the Aquaman! And also at this time at the royal court, Reverend Mother Sita tells Wrath that their concern is magic. He has encircled their nation with a crown of thrones, a shield of defensive sorcery that has not been used in thousands of years. He has liberated other instruments from the arsenals of the silent school and sanctioned them for use. Things that their ancestors shut away in the vaults for a good reason. And Wrath asks, are you questioning me? Seta says that they of the Widowhood merely offer their counsel. The Widowhood only exists to safeguard the welfare of of Atlantis. In the past weeks of becoming king, he has armed himself with more magic from the Silent School than any previous monarch has done in their entire reign, including Orm. Wrath stands up telling her the devices are perfectly safe when employed with due caution. Isn't that right, Magister Loke? Loke quietly says with due caution, yes, but... Wrath stops him, stating, See? Even the master of the Silent School says so. I am simply making you safe. Atlantis has the technology, the magic, and the will to remain secure against any aggressor. Wrath uses a magical weapon and destroys a statue, shouting that he will destroy any enemy that comes to their gates, or any enemy who threatens from within. A short while back at the Ninth Tried, the Hooded Enforcer from before reports to Crush that they were attacked by the Aquaman. Crush says, the Aquaman? I thought that he was a street tail. Get the boys together, there's a vigilante in the ninth. Well, we're going to be hunting him, but I will not have the good King Wrath finding fault with our agreement. As word of the Aquaman travels through Atlantis, it falls in the ears of the royal court, and Wrath asks, do you think this man is Arthur? Ursel tells him, no, Arthur is dead. Isn't that right? Merc. Merc calls out his arm, stating that he put the blade through Arthur himself. He dumped the body in an unmarked grave in the waste. His trident was put back into the treasury. King Arthur is dead. Wrath then says, regardless, I will not stand for this. It would seem that my partners in the Ninth cannot be trusted to watch over the zone. Commander Ursel, mobilize the drift. The Ninth Tried will be purged. 
Later in the night, the drift surrounds some of the mutants, calling out that they must rid Atlantis of the unclean rats. And just as one grabs a woman with long white hair, her arms begin to form scales, and she swipes, cutting the soldier's wrist. The other soldiers talk amongst themselves, asking if they saw that. A mutation. The tainted bloods are forbidden within the kingdom. The woman stands in front of the other dwellers as those dwellers shout that this is their home. They have lived here for generations, and they are just trying to survive. The soldier tells the man to shut up. The king says that if they are found, they must be put down. Sanction them all! Before the soldiers could do anything, though, the shadow of Arthur appears behind them. Arthur swims by, grabbing the men, knocking them into each other one by one. The white-haired woman watches, and as another soldier gets ready to attack, she strikes, knocking him out. Arthur tells everyone to scatter. Drift reinforcements will be here soon. The white-haired woman stays, but as Arthur tries to tell her to go, she points at her throat. She motions to herself, then Arthur and Arthur asks, Do you want me to come with you? The woman folds her arms and Arthur sighs. For God's sake. He grabs the woman by the arm and he swims off, stating that she will do exactly what he tells her. Can't you talk? What is your name? Back on the surface, Tula's phone rings, and as she picks it up, she begins to hear someone frantically trying to talk. She tells that person to calm down, and she holds the phone over to Mara so that she can hear. Volko shouts that, yes, it's that Volko, and I need to speak to Lady Mara. We're in the silent school, and we don't have much time before we're found. Listen to me, Arthur is a... But before he could finish, the line goes dead. Mara's eyes widen as she stands up grabbing the crown stating that he's alive. She will drag the whole kingdom to the surface if she has to. No one is getting between them ever again. Back in the ninth, Arthur and the white-haired woman fight their way through the waves of drift soldiers. But then the woman motions with her hands and covers her eyes. Arthur asks, what, cover my? The woman frowns at him as if telling him to hurry and Arthur sighs, fine. Okay. Just then the woman's body begins to glow and with a bright flash, she stuns everyone. That was a bioluminescent flash. It would seem that this woman has talents of her own. The next wave of soldiers swim through in pursuit, but then everyone stops when they hear several loud booming sounds. One of the soldiers shouts to the others that the city is under attack, mobilized to outer defenses. The thunderous booming is coming from none other than Mara, as she attempts to break down the crown of thorns. Over in the royal court, Wrath watches Mara attacking, and he asks Loke if that's even possible for Mara to be able to break through this thing. Loke tells him that the crown of thorns is the strongest and oldest enchantment kept by the silent school. Nothing on earth could break it. Wrath laughs, stating, Let me watch with relish then as she exhausts herself with this futile tantrum. However, the question that we should be asking is, why is she attacking now? Meanwhile, over in the penitentiary vault, Volko finds himself there once again. Kind of missed this place. What is that noise, though? Merc shocks him, telling him to forget it. Answer his questions. Who was he trying to contact outside when they found him? Did he trigger Lady Mara's assault? Volko begins to breathe heavy as we see that he's being interrogated by Commander Merc. You're guilty of regicide and a traitor to the nation, Merc. You swore to protect King Arthur, but instead you stabbed him in the back like a coward for all of Atlantis to see. Go ahead and use those same arcane toys that the silent school has given you to torture me, but I will say precisely nothing. Arthur and the woman wait until the coast is clear, and Arthur asks if there's somewhere that they can go. Can she talk? The woman points to Arthur as if asking who is he, and Arthur says, I already told you once, my name is Orion. A nobody. Look, can you show me? But just then the woman swims off and Arthur asks, is that a yes? A short while later, she leads him to the dark part of the ninth and creates a pulsing glow with her hand. A voice then asks who goes there and a slab of rock is pushed aside as a man leans out shouting, Dolphin! Arthur follows the woman inside asking, So your name is Dolphin. The man who opened up the way yells, Do not bring outsiders in here! Gods below! Who are you pretending to be? Arthur tells him, No one. And the man says, Like hell! Look at what you're wearing! You're the one everyone's talking about, aren't you? The Aquaman. Well, Dolphin wouldn't have brought you here if she didn't trust you. What are you going to do? Save the taint bloods from the horror of King Wrath? Arthur tells him it's going to take more than the likes of me to save Atlantis. While Mera on the outside is continuing her assault on the crown of thorns, Volko yells from his cell asking, <laughs> That's her, isn't it? She won't stop, you know. Are you even listening, guard? Seto walks into the cell, stating that the guard is... Uh, indisposed at the moment. Volko says that he's honored to have the widowhood come to death row to gloat at his demise. She tells him that he was an elder. They didn't see eye to eye. He was always a meddler, a kingmaker, a kingbreaker, toying with the destiny of Atlantis for personal gains. Volko scoffs. Oh, I'm sure the widowhood would have surely been above all of that. Seta tells him, either way, Mera of Zebel will not break the crown of thorns. The widowhood currently finds itself in opposition with Coram Wrath's regime. We are now in need of a seasoned manipulator. As Seta walks away, Volko then asks, 
What are you trying to say? As Seta tells him, you will find that your cell door is unlocked. For now, an enemy of my enemy is my friend. Back at Dolphin's hideout, Arthur asks the mutants, so you're all undesirables? One of the men then says it's because they're poor, really. Another says it's because of their mutation. You don't sink a race of men into the sea and expect that not to change them. That's what the sea does. Bio-adaptions have been going on for centuries. The other from before then says that Wrath doesn't like their kind. They aren't pure Atlanteans. Which is funny, the mutations have gotten worse since he became king. But just then, Dolphin looks back and everyone asks what is going on. Crush's mage, Cadaver, looks at everyone and creates a coral reef from his arm and strikes one of Dolphin's friends. Arthur then charges at Cadaver and hits him, thinking that this mage's specialty seems to be coral form manipulation. It's a craft that the Artisan Guild uses to grow structures, but this one's turned it into a lethal weapon. Dolphin then swims in, hitting him, but Cadaver creates more coral and punches her back. Arthur gut punches Cadaver, shouting for him to leave her alone. And while Arthur is close, Cadaver grabs him by the head and begins to shock him. But before Cadaver could kill him, Crush tells him to wait. They can't kill the Hotline. If that's who they think it is, the good king will kneel before Crush. Before long, Arthur opens up his eyes and he sees Crush standing over him and Crush tells him, Hey there, talk to me for a bit. Arthur looks around the cave asking where are they and Crush tells him that this is his lair down a nameless backstreet in the Ninth Tried. Welcome, Aquaman. Arthur says that he doesn't feel very welcomed and Crush says that he wouldn't think so. He did brutalize some of his followers. Arthur then grabs onto the coral to try and break it but it shocks him and Crush tells him, Yeah, don't do that. As Arthur lets go, he asks where's Dolphin and Crush motions to the window stating that she is safe for now. More useful alive. Arthur shouts, You're just some criminal. And Crush says, Well, Life's not fair sometimes. You gotta get to the top to survive down here. Arthur asks, is that so? I think you rain down here because Wrath allows it. The drift didn't touch you. How does that work? You keep the peace here and Wrath leaves you alone? Wrath wants mutants purged, but he wants you to do the dirty work? There's a word for that. It's called a collaborator. You do know that Wrath will come for you, right? Crush smiles, telling him, there's insurance for that. The old king isn't really dead. Well, that would cause some problems, wouldn't it? So let us establish who you really are. Arthur tells him that he won't talk and Crush laughs. Oh, but you'll let the girl die, right? Arthur Curry of the House of Atlan better speak up. The girl, she isn't alone in there. Over in Atlantis, Merc leads the drift in search of Volko, but as the patrol passes by, Volko mutters to himself, What did Seta want me to do exactly? I'm being hunted. How am I supposed to get out of the palace? A hand reaches out and a female voice tells him that Seta expects him to use his wits. But as the hand touches Volko, he shouts, Neptune's balls, who are you? The woman tells him that her name is Undyne. Mother Seta sent her to watch his back, act as a go-between, assist him with general stuff. Volko asks, are you with the Widowhood? You really don't look the part. And Undyne looks away, stating that she was disgraced. Volko asks, disgraced? That's my favorite kind of sister. And Undyne asks, was that an innuendo? I'm not going to like you, am I? As Volko goes to respond, she covers his mouth and two drift soldiers float by. Ondine then stabs one in the back and takes his gun, shooting the other. Volko shouts, You're on the Widowhood! You just killed! And Ondine says, How do you think I got disgraced? Now let's get to work. We need to get into the treasury. Meanwhile, over at the Titan's Tower in Manhattan, Nightwing says that it's kind of unexpected. Mara tells him that she apologizes for visiting without warning, but she needs to speak with Garth privately. The two walk off and Mara says that surely he's heard the news. Garth tells her that indeed he has. Arthur is disposed, or worse. A new king, Wrath, the terrorist who led the deluge, now sits on the throne. To make matters worse, Atlantis has cut itself off from the world, but how are you? Mara sighs, stating that she's coping, exiled all over again. She understands that the surface superheroes cannot attack, which is why she's come to him. Arthur lives, but she can't get to him. Atlantis is sealed inside of a magical barrier called the Crown of Thorns, an old dark secret of the Silent School. And Garth then says, why are you here? Mara says because he was a student of the Silent School once. He says that he renounced the craft of magic. What skills he possesses, he'll never use again. Please don't ask him to do this. She places her hand on his shoulder, telling him that he's the only person in the world who understands the workings of Atlantean magic. The only person that she can turn to, please help her get through that barrier. Back down below in the Ninth Tried, Crush tells Arthur that he better hurry or the golfer will have a nice little snack. Arthur looks at Dolphin as she huddles back, but just before the golfer can bite down, killing Dolphin, it stops. Crush says, 
There it is, an admission without even uttering a word. Aqua telepathic control, a unique trait to Arthur Curry. Even though you were a worthless king, you have the power to at least protect us from just being here. Arthur shouts that he will show them power, and just then the golfer breaks free and attacks Crush's men. Arthur calls to Dolphin to follow, but Dolphin glares at him. He asks, what? I had to save you. Yes, even if it did mean showing them the truth. But while the two escape, Crush yells to Cadaver to bring them back. Up ahead, Arthur punches through one of the guards and asks Dolphin if she can do that bioluminescent flash again. She shrugs her shoulders and Arthur says, No? Do you need more time to recharge? Guess it's up to me then. Over at the Tower of Widowhood, one of the sisters tells Seta that a message came through from Agent Ondine. Volko is safe and they plan to penetrate the royal treasury. Volko claims that King Arthur is also still alive. Seta says that that would suit perfectly, actually. Arthur versus Wrath. That would split Atlantis and lead to a civil war, no doubt. And when they've killed each other, the Widowhood can emerge to solve the city's wounds and save the people by appointing a new monarch. The sisterhood asks, who would they appoint? Seta tells her, the only viable choice, Mara of Zebel will become the ruler of Atlantis. One of the gang leaders in the Ninth Triad, Crush, discovered that Aquaman had survived and planned on using Aquaman as a prisoner to get what he wanted from King Wrath. But Aquaman Arthur Curry had managed to get away, and now Cadaver, one of Crush's goons, is chasing him. Back in the Ninth Triad, Cadaver creates a dozen coral reef shards and begins to shoot them and Arthur swims by grabbing Dolphin and tells her to flee. Arthur then uses his aqua telepathic abilities to summon a swarm of fish to surround Cadaver. But before they could fully engulf him, Cadaver creates a coral reef or web and pushes them back. However, in doing so, he created a direct path to himself and Arthur shoots in, punching him into the wall. Cadaver pulls himself out, firing a large reef and slamming Arthur into the opposite wall. Arthur fights back, breaking the first reef, but Cadaver just creates another, pinning him down. As Arthur struggles to free him, himself, he notices Cadaver creating a hooked sword out of the reef. Old tyrants of Atlantis would use this to cut the hamstrings and Achilles tendons of their enemies, leaving them crippled and helpless. Meanwhile, just outside of Atlantis, Garth is looking at the barrier surrounding the city and he asks, is this the crown of thorns? Mara says that she knows that he has renounced magic, but Garth stops to state that he was once a pupil of the silent school, but he has not forgotten the fundamentals. Magic is a seductive, corrupting power. He chose a different life and he rejected its ways, but this is bigger than him. And this is for the fate of Atlantis and Arthur. Garth begins to gather his power, stating that he will do the best that he can. But back with Arthur, Cadaver gets ready to swing when suddenly Dolphin grabs him from behind, placing her hands over his eyes. Before he has a chance to react, she releases a concentrated flash into his eyes. Arthur breaks free, cracking Cadaver in the face. Arthur then tells Dolphin that he told her to leave. Why do you keep sticking around with me? Dolphin smiles and swims off, with Arthur asking, Oh, now you're leaving? Over in the throne room, Wrath watches on a screen with Garth standing outside of the kingdom, and he asks, She at it again? He then asks Loke, What kind of power are we talking? Do they have enough to bring down the crown of thorns? Loke tells him, Well, Garth was a potent student. There is a remote chance. Wrath stops him, stating that they will go out there and stop them then. The Magisters can pass through the barrier. Just go out there and make sure that that remote chance becomes zero. Meanwhile, elsewhere at the Ninth Tried, Arthur and Dolphin finally stop running with Arthur stating that he has an idea why she's following him. She knows who he is, or at least who he was. She has taken him to different places to show him what it's truly like down here in the underworld. You expect me to save you, don't you? Is that what you had in mind? That I'm going to rise up against the tyrant and reclaim the throne to protect the innocent and the downtrodden? However, it wasn't Quorum Wrath that disposed of me. It was Atlantis itself. I never wanted to be king, and when the duty fell to me, I did my best. But that chance was too much for Atlantis. I was cast out and replaced by a new king with an even more traditional outlook. I had no choice but to leave, but they wouldn't even let me do that. I tried to save the city, but all I could do was help people one by one. I failed at being a king. My name is Orin now, the Aquaman. I will help these people, but I am not the man who will lead a revolt against wrath. It would be wrong for you to pin your hopes on me. Someone else will save Atlantis. Back outside of the Crown of Thorns, Mera calls to Garth and he tells her that he's kind of concentrating here. Just then, Loke calls out to Mera and Garth telling them, In the name of King Wrath, you are declared traitors to Atlantis. Your lives are now forfeit. Garth yells at Mera to get behind him, but as she does, Garth releases an energy field knocking the Magisters back. 
He quickly grabs Mera by the hand, stating that they need to hurry, that that won't buy them much time. Bloke and his magisters are high adepts of the silent school. They are magicians of profound ability. Mera then pulls back, shouting, No! We have to fight! Arthur is trapped behind that barrier, and we have to find a way through. But while Garth fends the magisters back, Bloke tells him that he spent far too long with these costume-clad surface fools that he calls friends. You are too much like the False King. You followed Arthur blindly like a pet. You have forgotten the values of Atlantis. Garth rips an amulet off of one of the magisters, stating that he has not forgotten the silent school, and I have not forgotten what you did to Sira. Back with Arthur, though, Dolphin begins to draw symbols with her lights. Arthur asks if this is supposed to cheer him up. I know what that is. That's Superman. Dolphin continues drawing the rest of the Justice League, and with them, she draws Aquaman's symbol. He smiles, stating that he sees. Because he stands with them, that he's a hero, too? Maybe. Sometimes. But you're not looking at me to be a hero. You're looking at me to be a king. Dolphin then draws a little crown over Superman's symbol. And Arthur says, no, Superman is not a king. Dolphin covers the crown and Arthur tells her, Superman is just a man who saves people. They all do. You don't expect them to rule afterwards though. Dolphin smiles and motions to him. And Arthur laughs. He says, for someone who can't speak, you sure can say a lot. Back outside of Atlantis, Loke shouts to the Magisters to level the Earth and drive them out into the open. But a bit away, Mera asks, who exactly was Sira? Garth looks away, stating that she was a girl that he knew. At the silent school, they were the most gifted students. Mera then says that he loved her, and Garth tells her, yes, he did. Loke and the others pushed them both really hard. They wanted them to master the most dangerous and forbidden of the silent crafts. He made a mistake in spell work one day, a particularly lethal one. And Sira died. Mera begins to get back up, stating that they need to get back to the surface. It was wrong of her to... Garth holds out the amulet, stating that he took this from one of the Magisters. Take it to get into Atlantis while he draws the Magisters away. However, the amulet is damaged. It may get you in, but it may also fail. There's no telling what it could do to you. Mera takes the amulet, kissing Garth on the cheek, stating that she will take her chances. And thank you. Arthur would be proud of the man that you've become. A few seconds later, Garth swims back out, shouting to Loke and the others to come. See if they can catch the Tempest! While Garth leads the others away, Mero watches and quietly says, Please be safe while I work on this. Over with Arthur, he asks Dolphin what does she want, a hero to bring down Wrath, not a king to rule this place? Dolphin smiles and nods, and Arthur tells her, All right, then you have Aquaman. Back at the palace, Merc asks, What business do you have here? This is no place for taint bloods like you. Crush says, Commander Merc, I have come to seek audience with your most royal majesty, King Wrath. It is a matter of great importance. Merc says, The king has no time for scum like you. Oh, but he does! And Merc asks, Such as? I have come here as a true Atlantean citizen, honest, loyal, and I want to tell the majesty that the false King Arthur is still alive. Merc pauses and then simply says, Of course he is! Crush asks, What do you? But before he can finish, Merc thrusts his blade into Crush's skull. Meanwhile, on the third tried, the resistance stirs, led by an unlikely leader, Jurok Bias, once the master of the royal bestiary, the king's keeper of monsters. But while Bias leads the resistance to face the drift, the drift has their own beast, namely the Grand Sire Sore. Bias's mind goad would have easily controlled a monster like this, but now, cold magic directs the beast into a killing fury. So to keep the resistance alive, one man must fight by their side. And at that moment, Arthur Curry swims up from below, cracking the Grand Sire Sore in the jaw. However, while Arthur runs with the resistance, Mera pushes through the crown of thorns into the ninth try. She stands up, stating, she's in! Oh, Arthur, I will find! But as she takes another breath, she begins to choke. The bystanders of the crowd begin to ask what is going on, someone help her. And a man smiles, stating, nah, get the king. Back in the third tried, Arthur tries to control the Grand Sire Sore, but as hard as he tries, the beast doesn't listen. He reaches into the Grand Sire Sore's ear and he says, I'm sorry. And then there's a wunch. As more drift arrive, Arthur calls out to Dolphin, and Dolphin swims out. As the drift get closer, she releases her bioluminescent flash. Bice says that it's really him, and as he hugs him, he says, Oh, sorry, I know I shouldn't put my hands on. But Arthur tells him, no, I am no king, not anymore. Just a man who has come to stand with the resistance. Elsewhere in the ninth, the hooded man from before tells a shadowy person that it's what they thought. She's in the penance stable, but very sick. This is a great opportunity. King Shark steps out of the shadows, telling Kreen that this is it. By the end of the week, he intends to make their gang the new power of the ninth. Shark then leans in over Mara's air pen, laughing, stating, aren't you a tasty morsel? Back in the third, Bice introduces Arthur as the Aquaman. But the Resistance members then ask why is he pretending to be the old king? That is disrespectful. Why would they follow him? 
Volko pushes his way through the crowd asking, yeah, why should we follow him? But as Volko gets closer, Arthur tells everyone, my name is Oren now. Volko says, at great pains to distance yourself from what you once were, huh? But I suppose I would be too if I made a crap awful mess of ruling Atlantis. Arthur shouts, that's rich coming from the man who betrayed Atlantis more than once. Ondine runs up holding something yelling, oh, just get over it. There's bad blood between you, we get it. Arthur says, who's this? And Volko says that it's Ondine, a friend. And she's right. There will be a time to resolve their differences, but right now, the resistance needs a figurehead. Ondine hands the object to Arthur and Volko turns to everyone stating, listen! Wrath must be stopped. It's as simple as that. This man alone can lead us to salvation from Wrath's tyranny. What do you say, Oren? Arthur pulls back the cloth, stating, I do have one thing to say. He holds the trident up, loudly speaking. Atlantis uprising! All across Atlantis, people see what their king, Quorum Wrath, is really like. He's a tyrant. He has reinforced the authority of the old magic of Atlantis, magic that has been forbidden for centuries. Once he took the throne, he had the magistrates of the Silent School create the impenetrable barrier known as the Crown of Thorns. It can be said that the Crown of Thorns protects Atlantis from all outside threats, but it also traps people inside of the city. And the Ninth Tribe, Wrath's secret police, the Drift, patrol the streets gathering all the poor and mutated Atlanteans for another purge. But just before the Drift could activate the kill nets, a school of fish start nipping away at one of the soldiers. As the soldier brushes the fish away, Arthur, now wielding his trident, tells the soldiers to let these people go. The mutants from inside the kill net shout that it's him. It's Aquaman, Atlan, bless us. And as Arthur fights, he fights not as a man trying to reclaim his throne, but he fights as a man trying to help those in need, no matter their social status. As the last soldier falls, Arthur rips open the kill nets, telling the people that there is no need to talk. Spread the word, justice is coming. A short while later at the Resistance's stronghold, Volko tells Arthur that that was a good line. Justice is coming, spoken like the returning king. And Arthur tells him, no. I'm just a man who's going to end Wrath's tyranny. Mira is waiting for me on the surface. She is my destiny, not the throne. Volko tells him, right, well, the clock is running. The rebellion has now begun and Arthur stops him again. I do not want your advice. The undercurrent is too weak for a full on attack. Volko again tries to tell him, all right, all right, we have a history. You don't trust me. That much is clear. Arthur tells him, trust you? You were once the respected council elder. Now, you're a master manipulator, pushing your own personal agenda that nearly doomed Atlantis. But while the two of them go back and forth, the outcasted Widowhood sister Ondine listens and records her findings. Over at the Tower of Widowhood, Reverend Mother Seta receives Ondine's report inside, stating that Volko still can't persuade Aquaman to risk an attack on the Crown of Thorns. If that tiresome fool can't get him to budge, the Undyne will have some new chores to perform. Wrath abuses the Silent School's magic, but the magic makes him too powerful for the Widowhood to move against him openly. Seta tells him that her aide will send word back to Undyne, and if Aquaman hesitates because his rebels are still too weak, they can have Undyne offer a suggestion. Back in the undercurrent stronghold, Ondine stands before Arthur and the others, stating that the gangs of the Ninth Tribe are powerful and lawless, and they have no love for Wrath. If they wanted them to stand with them, they would just need persuasion. Arthur folds his arms, stating that he's not quite sure who she even is. And Ondine tells him that she is a concerned citizen who pledges her support for the rebellion. Bice then says they can't seriously be considering those tainted blood criminals as... But Arthur stops him, telling him, do not use that term. We fight for all Atlanteans, including the Sea Changed. Ondine goes in, telling Arthur that the rival bosses fight to control the territory. Such anarchy makes it ideal to forge alliances. And a little while later, in the ninth, two rival gangs, one led by King Shark and one led by Long Strabo, meet in the streets to settle their differences. Not far off, Arthur and Dolphin watch, and Arthur says that Ondine is right. It's almost tempting to just sit and watch the whole thing as they kill each other. But as tempting as that may be, they need to clear out the innocents and break up this nonsense. Before Shark can finish off Strabo, Arthur calls out asking if he's going to drown the ninth in blood, and the gangs here are pretty much doing Wrath's dirty work for him. Shark swims towards Arthur, telling his men to attack, but as Shark hits Arthur, Arthur says, I am not here to fight. The two of them slam into a rock, and Shark says that's funny. Your kind did never come to the ninth unless you want to scrap. Arthur knocks Shark back, telling him to look wrath, wants you punished for siding with the resistance. And Shark shouts, we aren't with anyone. And Arthur says, why not? The resistance and the gangs have a common enemy. Shark scoffs, telling him, swim on, meatbag. The people here have always been cheated and overlooked by the uptried bastards. Wrath was out of line just like us. He would never. Arthur stops him and states, 
Wrath was. A proud heritage that he chooses to erase. He's up tried now, ashamed of his true origins. Remember Crush? Crush was so dangerous that he made a pact with Wrath. And Crush was supposed to keep the gangs in line down here. Now he's mysteriously vanished. But while Arthur speaks with Shark, Dolphin hears somebody coming and calling for help from one of the caves. She hurries down to follow the voice, but when she finds where it came from, the man yells, please. She can't breathe underwater anymore. Dolphin looks at what the man is talking about and he shouts, it's Lady Mara. Her tank's almost out of air. She's going to die. Dolphin quickly places her hand over the man's eyes and then using her flash, forces everyone to take a look. Shark asks what the hell was that and Arthur rushes over calling out to Dolphin asking what is going on. But before he can finish, he sees the air tank on Mera and he realizes what's going on. Oh God. As the rage takes over, he smashes the tank, pulling off Mera's mask to give her air. And she weakly asks, is that you? Arthur tells her to hold on and the man yells that she's breathing. How did he do that? Was it? Magic? Arthur says it is only a temporary fix. She's dying. They need to get help. And Ondine swims up, stating that she knows where to go. Arthur asks what is she doing here, and Ondine smiles, telling him that she followed him, mainly to keep an eye on him. So get used to that. It's the kind of thing that she does. Now, do you want help or not? A short while later over at the Tower of the Widowhood, Seta says that Lady Mera was wounded by magic. Her ability to breathe water is rapidly decreasing. Soon she'll be fully restored to her former state, provided that she gets to the surface and recuperates in there, in fresh air and sunlight. Arthur asks what of the crown of thorns, and Seta tells him, indeed, the crown's magic traps us all, even with my charms protecting her. She needs to get to the surface. If not, she will be dead within 10 hours. Arthur then asks, how can they bring down the crown of thorns? And Bice and the undercurrent are reluctant. The resistance movement isn't strong enough without support. And Ondine says that she thought he was the one in charge here. And Arthur asks her, have you been working with the Widowhood all along? Ondine tells him that she is Reverend Mother's troubleshooter. She would not have revealed her hand so early, but Mara is important to them. Arthur says, what is that supposed to mean? And Seta follows up telling him, wrath must fall. The Widowhood has been doing what it can behind closed doors. Arthur shouts, you supported me in being overthrown. You helped put Wrath in the throne in the first place. And Seta tells him that Wrath was only ever supposed to interim until a better candidate could be found. Someone who is worthy of the throne. Someone like Mara. Arthur yells, Mara? You would have Mara be queen. And Seta says that she is a fine choice. Royal blood and a true creature of the sea, not half surface like him. She would bring peace between Zebel and Atlantis. Arthur tells her, it isn't that simple. I will save Mera and rid Atlantis of wrath so that Mera and I can marry and spend our lives away from here. Seta says that sacrifices must be made. Sacrifices is what heroes do. We save others and not think of ourselves. You can save Atlantis from wrath and Mera can save Atlantis' future as a great queen. Do you even need to think about this or are you not such a hero after all? Later, when Mera has enough strength to talk, Arthur sits there and she asks, so they want me to be queen? That would mean giving up on us. But we both know what has to be done. And Arthur asks, do you want to be queen? Mara says no. She wants to marry and love him, live in the lighthouse until they're old and gray. However, she was raised as royalty. She understands a duty. It always comes first for people like them. The two of them, they will never live normal lives, even if they tried. While she thought he was dead, grief consumed her. And when she discovered that he was alive, she shook the ocean floor itself to try and reach him. Since the day that they met, she has seen what a hero means. And in the last few months, she even served with the Justice League. They were put on this earth to serve the highest purpose. Their loves and desires must always come second to those ideals. No one wants to be king or queen, except for people like Korm Wrath, which proves that ambition should be an instant disqualification. You never took the crown because you wanted to. You knew you had to. I don't want to be queen, but I'm terrified that I may have to be. Arthur tells her to forget all of that. He believes in their future. A future that may end if they don't get her to the surface soon. He must face wrath even if he's alone. And back in the ninth, Shark asks, So you're back? And Arthur tells him yes, to get to my answer. The gangs won't commit unless they're fighting for a king who will champion for the people of the ninth. There will be no such king. You have had Mera of Zebel in your care here. And Shark says, right, until you snatched her away, she was drowning. We did what we could for her. Arthur tells him, right, I'm sure she would have been a useful hostage. Nevertheless, you tried to help her. Your kindness will not be forgotten. The next Queen of Atlantis will always remember how the people of the Ninth tried saved her life. Shark asks, Her? Queen? You're lying. And Arthur tells him, Time is running out. The undercurrent intends to attack the Crown of Thorns without delay. Will the gangs offer their support? Shark says that he's desperate, saying anything to convince them. But he also remembers what happened to Crush. The tyrant is too strong. His answer is no. Later, at the undercurrent stronghold, Arthur tells everyone that it will just be them leading the assault. The crown comes down, and it comes down now. 
A short while later at the Silent School College, Commander Ursel meets with Magister Loke to inform him that Wrath has ordered the creation of more kill nets. Loke says, what more? It takes a while for the adepts to craft such items. Commander, the king's use of magic is becoming extravagant. I'm starting to fear that it is beginning to affect him adversely. Does he appear more erratic? Ursel asks, you question our king's mental stability. And Loke responds, he seems more frequently volatile. Exposure to sorcery can contaminate the mind. We here at the school take great precautions, but the king handles magic like a toy and... But before he can finish his loud explosion with Ursel asking, what the hell? And Arthur descends, stating, yes, hell is right, undercurrent, with me! Vice tells the others that they heard him, follow Aquaman! Ursel shoots some of the resistance, telling Loke that they will be targeting the school's inner sanctum. Gather the students and defend it. Loke calls out to the other magisters and the acolytes to wake every student in the school. They must purge these devils. Vice sends in the sea beast, but as the magisters push back with their magic, they end up injuring Thrasher. Vice swims up, stating, no. Easy now, Jurik will make them pay. But before Vice can swim up, Ursel shoots him, shouting, Old Jurik is a traitor to the throne. You were once the royal beastmaster. Where's your loyalty now? Just as Ursel goes to pull the trigger, Dolphin punches and Ursel shouts, How dare a taint blood strike me! Ursel charges him, but Dolphin punches her back again. As Arthur continues destroying everything in his path, making his way to the source of the Crown of Thorns' power, he looks at it, stating that this is what imprisons their city. He lifts up his trident, but before he can strike, Loke binds him with magic, stating that he will find the school's inner sanctum well defended. The Crown of Thorns will endure. Meanwhile, in the throne room, Merc reports that the undercurrent has laid assault upon the silent school. Their target is undoubtedly the Crown of Thorns. Wrath grabs Leo by the face, stating, You swore that they didn't have the numbers. Leo tries to speak, but Wrath throws him to the side, and Merc says that the rebels appear under strength, acting in desperation. He's already ordered a full diversion of the Drift to counterattack, but they won't be needed. Magister Loke has rallied the entire enclave of the silent school to defend the crown. The rebels will be slaughtered. Wrath watches and smiles as Arthur slowly begins to lose the fight, stating that it would seem that the false king has returned from the dead, if only briefly. For all of its power, the royal trident will not safeguard him. Not against the combined might of the silent school. Arthur slams the trident into the ground to help stop him from being destroyed by the magic, but just then Shark shouts to his men that it's frenzy time. Shred them! Shark's gang quickly swims in, attacking the magisters, and Arthur picks himself up, replying with, I'm surprised to see you. Shark tells him, well, I had to think. If Aquaman is foolish enough to stand up against King Wrath and mount this raid, maybe the gangs of the Ninth should stand with him. Loke casts his magic, asking Arthur, so you need criminals to fight by your side. A man's character may be judged by the company that he keeps. Arthur strikes back, asking, what does that say about your character then? With Loke out of the way, Shark says that this is it. Do what you came to do. And Arthur tells everyone to brace themselves. He thrusts himself into the concentrated source of magic, powering the crown of thorns. And shortly after, the crown begins to fade. Over at the Tower of Widowhood, Seta says that Atlantis is free. They must proceed without delay. Volko, sisters, all of you must bear solemn witness to this. According to the ancient laws of the Elder Council, I hereby proclaim Amara of Zebel, Queen of Atlantis. Volko asks, a foreigner on the throne? Atlan will be turning in his grave over this. Oh well, long live the queen, except she's dying. We'll never get her to the surface in time to. But Arthur comes in stating, I can. He picks up Mera, with Seta telling him to make haste. His wife-to-be breathes her last breath. And so, Arthur swims, pushing through the pain, pushing through the hurt, till he finally reaches Amnesty Bay. He walks up on the coast with Tula running out, asking if it's really him. Oh my god! And Arthur tells her Mera is sick. She'll get stronger now that she's on the surface, but she needs to heal. It'll take time for the curse to lift. This is Mera's fight, and only then will her powers return and allow her back into the sea. Tula asks if he's sure, and Arthur says, The Widowhood has told me so. Look after her. Guard her well. She is the Queen of Atlantis now. Tula pauses for a moment and says, Wait, she's what? Mera groans, asking if it's him, and Arthur says, Yes, my love. My queen. She then says, You did it? Arthur kisses her, saying, For I? How could I not? For now, you must remain here in Tula's care. You're going to need all of the strength that you can get for the coming months. A great destiny awaits you, one neither of us expected. I love you more than the world, and I always will. He gets up and he begins to walk back into the sea with Tula shouting, asking, Where are you going? And Arthur looks back, stating, Where do you think? Corm Wrath still holds the throne of Atlantis. I'm going to finish this. It was another night in Louisiana, as Orm sits with the young boy Tommy, telling him the stories of a world where he used to live. Tonight's story was Atlan, and how he hurled the giant Kraken swore back into the maelstrom it spawned from to save the people of Atlantis. However, 
Something different happened this night. When Orm put Tommy to bed, Tommy said goodnight to Dad. Orm smiled as he went back down the stairs, telling Aaron, Tommy's mother, what he said. As Orm kisses Aaron on the cheeks, he says that it's so great to hear, and then he begins to help her with the dishes. This was not the life Orm thought that he would have, living on land, staying with the dry mouths. He first met Aaron when he was on his way back to the ocean. He saved their lives and stayed to protect them, but it was only supposed to be temporary. Even though the call of the sea never fades, this time it's not as loud as it used to be. While Orm helps Aaron clean up, he overhears the news of the attack in MST Bay. The report says that the target of this attack was apparently Mara, the so-called mermaid wife of Arthur Curry, the Aquaman. Rumors suggest that there is political strife and perhaps a civil war underway in Atlantis, with concerns that the trouble may spread onto U.S. soil. As the report goes on, Orm clenches his glass, breaking it in his hand. Aaron runs over, asking if everything's okay. Sometimes she forgets how superhuman he really is. Was it something on the news that upset him? And Orm says no, it just took him by surprise. She tells him that the news mentioned trouble in Atlantis. Is he not tempted to go back? To go and get involved? But he tells her not to fret. His life is here with Tommy and her. But six hours earlier, Mara was facing off against this attacker, the eel. It wasn't long ago that Mara returned to the surface to recover from an injury that she sustained while attempting to free Arthur from the magic imprisoning the people of Atlantis. The magical barrier was taken down and Mara was able to return to the surface, but the magic affecting her had drained her powers, so much so that she couldn't even breathe underwater. At her peak, a fight with the eel would have been over in seconds, but with her powers in a state of healing, even the eel is proving to be a struggle. The eel smacks Mara down, asking if that's the best she's got. He's heard that she was supposed to be tough, like Justice League tough. She tries to get back up, but the eel picks her up, throwing her into the water, telling her that this is the easiest money that he has ever made. She begins to swim back up to the surface, but before she can reach it, Eel dives in, holding her underwater, choking her, squeezing out every last bit of air that she has, and everything begins to go black. The water is supposed to be her home. She should feel alive here. It is the place where she spent her life growing up to kill Arthur. But that's when she realized that he was the one man that she truly loved. Her father, the King of Zebel, raised her to be an assassin under the watchful eye of Warlord Nereus and the Master of Arms, Liron. Liron would train her day in and day out, faulting her for relying too heavily on her powers. He would overpower her, telling her how weak she was for having to even use her powers. He taught her all the skills of war. The blade, the fist. She should be able to win without out powers. As Mera opens up her eyes, she sees that she is still underwater, and Liron's lessons have served their purpose. She easily deflects Eel's oncoming attack, throwing him onto the pier's support, bringing down the dock. Tula, the woman who was supposed to be keeping Mera in bed, runs out shouting, Holy crap, you shouldn't be fighting! Mera lifts Eel out of the water, telling her that she isn't the one who started it. Later, in the lighthouse, Superman and Wonder Woman say that they have Eel secured, but who would plan an attack like that? Mara sighs, stating that she would imagine Eel was hired by her enemies in Atlantis. Quorum Wrath won't openly attack her on land, but instead hire a surface agent, and that would be how he would murder the Queen of Atlantis. Superman and Wonder Woman ask her, Queen? And Mara tells them yes. To her surprise, she has been declared Queen in Exile. Once that monster Wrath is overthrown, she is to be the next ruler of Atlantis. Wrath seized power by exploiting the people's dissatisfaction with Arthur's split loyalty for both Atlantis and the surface world. Arthur is currently in lead of a revolt now, but he refuses to take back the throne once Wrath is gone. What's worse is there is no way that they could involve the surface heroes in this. Atlantis is fighting a civil war to figure out its own identity, so until that's resolved, her mission is to keep the world calm while the events play out underneath the ocean. Tula whispers that they've got to tell them. So Mara sits back down and Tula explains that Mara isn't going down there because she was hurt when she went to Atlantis. There is magic lingering in her that is making her weak, but her powers will return in due time. Wonder Woman says that she's so sorry. What will she do while in exile? And Mara says that she didn't want to become queen, and she doesn't plan on staying queen longer than she has to. The elders will eventually find a more suitable replacement, but until then, she needs to keep the surface at bay until the crisis in Atlantis is resolved. And while Mara meets with the Secretary of State for the U.S., the life of Orm starts to become harder to bear. As he watches Aaron and Tommy play in the rain, with water falling from the sky and landing, that is something that he'll never get used to. As Orm looks out the window, he knows that he won't be able to stay here for much longer. It's going to be time for him to go. The next morning, Tommy wakes up and runs out of his room with his fishing pole, ready to tell Orm that he's ready. Aaron wakes up and she hears Tommy. But the other thing that she noticed is that the other side of her bed is empty and... 
Colt. Aaron hurries down the stairs asking what's going on and Tommy says the dad was supposed to teach him how to fish today, but he's not here. Aaron looks over and sees a note and when she reads it, Orm tells her there was a matter of great significance that he must deal with. His other family needs him for a while, but if fortune favors him, he shall return. Aaron tells Tommy that daddy has to go out, but he'll be back soon. Over at MST Bay, Mara awakens to hear a scream coming from inside of the lighthouse. She runs out asking what's wrong and Tula says that he, he was here. He said that he'd come find her. Mara says who and Tula points at the door stating, your half brother Orm. Mara walks down to the shore where Orm is, but before she can say anything, he says, hello, Mara of Zebel. After pausing for a moment, Mara asks, what do you want? He hasn't seen the stench of the ocean in a long time. She looks well. She asks again why he's here, and Orm says that he saw her on the news. He heard them speak of discord in Atlantis. Is it true? Is Arthur slain? Mara tells him that Arthur is alive, but dethroned. He's fighting a war against Coram Wrath. Orm looks out over the sea, stating that it's clear that he must go back. Atlantis is my home. It needs me, though I would not return to it by choice. The surface is my life now. Isn't that strange? I have found a life, a love, a family. It is a shame to give that up. Mara sees the joy in Orm's eyes and says that this is not a side of him that she would have guessed existed. He laughs. <laughs> Surprises me still. To find true love in the dry heat of the surface world I so despise. But as a man of royal blood, I am bound by my duty to return. Mara thinks back to the war for the throne and the things that Orm did and says perhaps Atlantis does not need his help. Orm asks, what right does she have to address him in such manner? Zebulon, you're not helping by being here. She tells him that she has her reasons and is doing her part here. But he should go back to his family that he claims to cherish. Atlantis isn't his home anymore. Atlantis already has someone. She is the queen. As those words sink in, Orm yells, no, no. By whose authority? You're not even Atlantean. Mara says perhaps not, but she was chosen and named queen in exile according to tradition. She'll return to Atlantis and rule once the war is finished. Until then, she stands there to protect Atlantis and its interests from external threats. Don't get dragged into the chaos of Atlantis again. Last time he was exiled, now he has something. Go back to your happy life. Mara reaches out telling him to wait, but Orm spins back, hitting Mara, shouting, Get your peasant hands off me! Using what power she has, she leaps from the water, striking Orm down, yelling, How dare you strike a queen! Before Mara could finish him, her powers fade again. So he picks himself up, asking, Are you holding back? Do you assume that I can be defeated that easily? But that's when Tula jumps on Orm's back, slamming his face into the water, shouting, Get back, she's hurt! Orm knocks Tula off, asking, What do you mean Mara is hurt? So Mara punches him, telling him, It's only temporary. The two go back and forth, with Mara knocking Orm down and telling him to just stay down. Atlantis has a monarch. It's me, and I forbid you from getting involved. Orm stands up, shouting in rage, You forbid me! You are nothing. I am the Ocean Master. Lightning strikes as Orm begins to create typhoons and launches Mara into the heart of it. Tula rushes in to help, but Orm tells Mara that she knows nothing about duty. You devil and vermin! Atlantis calls me! I will save it! As the waves die down, Orm holds his trident to Mara's throat, stating that she has seized this moment to usurp the throne of Atlantis for Zemel. The oldest enemy of Atlantis will not win through sub subterfuge. It's time things were ended once and for all. He raises his trident, but before he can strike, a voice calls out, Dad? Orm freezes. He looks up and he sees Tommy running towards him, asking, What are you doing? Tommy stumbles as he tries to go through the waves, shouting, Daddy, please don't hurt her! And Mara leans up quietly, telling Orm, not in front of your son, Orm. Orm looks at Aaron and she asks, What the hell is happening? Orm tells both of them, I don't expect you to understand. I have a duty to Atlantis. It is my responsibility as royal blood. Tommy asks, It's your duty to hurt people? Why are you dressed like that? Orm doesn't answer and Aaron says it's because he's going back. She knew he'd come here. And she saw how upset he got about the news. That stupid note. He promised that he would stay. He said he loved them. Orm's confused. Please, let me explain. I do love you, but my kingdom. Aaron shouts over him, telling him, You told me what being a king did to you. It wasn't good. Orm tries to tell her, The duty I have to. But Aaron stops him again. You have a duty to us. We were going to be married. Are you really choosing Atlantis over us? Why? Why aren't we good enough for you? A short while later, Tula plays with Tommy outside, leaving Mara, Orm, and Aaron to discuss things. Mara tells Aaron that she doesn't have to worry. Tula will take care of her son while they figure this whole thing out. Orm says, of course she will. Tula is his half-sister. Aaron turns back asking, you're what? After all this time, I still don't know a damn thing about you. For God's sake, your sister? Why haven't you told me these things? Is it because it would be difficult for us to understand? Orm tells her, 
When you are royal blood, there's a solemn burden of duty, a responsibility that... Mera interrupts him, stating, Allow me. A tyrant named Coram Wrath has seized the throne of Atlantis. The people are trying to overthrow him. The nation itself is divided. Our kin below are dying. It's brutal, bloody, and awful. Aaron then asks, This is why he must go? Is he going to help? Yes, Orm. Tell us, how can you help? Orm sighs. I am uncertain. I would first have to see the situation at hand and make a judgment call. All I know is that it is my duty. Aaron gets up, throwing her drink at him. God damn it! That word! I understand duty. It's to family, to the ones you love. Your duty is to Tommy and me, but you make that sound like an excuse. Mara stands up. This is different. Duty is ingrained into someone of royal lineage. It was bred into them from birth. They're indoctrinated with the concept of a higher purpose. When I was raised, I had a tutor. He instructed me in their people's traditions and made me study the old texts and ancient lore day after day, all to prepare me, as the Princess Azebel, to place the throne above all other concerns. When the warlord Nereus, on orders from my father the king, sent me to kill the king of our oldest enemies, I did not hesitate. Aaron asks, what happened after that? Mara smiles. I couldn't do it. I found the enemy king and he was not the monster that I expected. I fell in love with him. Our bond overcame all notions of duty. She is not at Arthur's side because she can't be. She was wounded, her powers are slowly returning, but they're still unpredictable. Aaron then says, she understands Mara's reasoning, but what about Orm's? He doesn't live in the ocean anymore. Orm tells her that if the civil war spreads, it will trigger a global conflict. It could affect the whole world, it could affect you. She says that she's starting to understand, but if it's that important, why were they fighting? Shouldn't they be working together? Mara laughs out loud and Aaron says, well, why not? It's important to both of you. You could work together for the common good, for duty, as Orm puts it. Aaron then says that they should at least talk it out. When Atlantis is safe, you can come back to me. Mara and Orm look at each other and Mara says, two of us have history. He tells them to consider it, talk to each other, please. She's gonna go check on Tommy. A short while later along the coast, Orm asks Tula if she believes that Mara and him can work together. Is it even possible? Tula says that she's not sure. Mara right now is trying to avoid global involvement. Orm tells her that that is a feasible course. A more direct approach is needed, but to weigh in on Arthur's side, they need an army. Not an army from the surface, but there is one ally that she can call upon. Tula thinks about it for a second and then yells, Mera is not going to like that. A short while later, Tula asks Mera if she's sure about this and she says, yes, they must go to Zebel. Mera and Tula watch as Orm says his goodbyes with the promise of soon returning, and with that, they dive into the waters. Mera leads Orm to the ancient barrier that protects Zebel, the shuttered kingdom of exiles. As soon as they pass, Orm sees the guards swimming towards them, stating, Ah, they welcome us. And one of the guards shouts, Invaders, get them both. Mera then begins to use her powers, telling Orm to remember, subdue them. Orm bashes one, stating, they raised a hand to me, an example must be made. He raises his trident, but Mara swims over telling him, no, these guards are just doing their duty, they must. But just then, the both of them are hit with an equally powerful blast from behind, down on the sea floor. Mara says that she warned him, they mustn't ignore their customs or provoke them. I'm pretty sure that we're past that, Lady Mara. All of the Zebel forces begin to surround them, and Liron says, well, well, King Nereus, look what the tide has washed in. Nereus tells him, Indeed, my arch enemy, Orm Marius, and my traitor wife, Mara. A short while later, in the Zebelian arena known as the Stand, a giant Octodon crawls towards Mara, and Orm yells, This is ridiculous! Ritual combat to even speak to the damned king? Mara tells him that she already told him once before that this is Zebelian custom, to gain the right of audience with the king. From his seat, Nereus shouts, Orm Marius, fallen king of cursed Atlantis! Mara, the treasonous renegade, you must prove yourselves in the right of supplication. Let the right commence! As he finishes, the massive Octodon rushes forward, and Mara tells Orm to just make sure to avoid the limbs and aim for the brain sack. Orm calls out that he has hunted Octodon before, woman. Don't you tell me how to! But before he could finish, the Octodon lashes out, throwing him into a pile of debris. Mara yells that she said, AVOID THE LIMBS! As the Octodon grabs onto Mara, Nereus sits up, asking Mara's grandmother, Lamia, that he trusts this beast of hers hasn't been fed. Lamia tells her that she hasn't fed it in weeks, and Laron laughs, stating, My money is still on, Lady Mara. Mara manages to free herself, but before she could fully use her powers, the Octodon reaches back out, wrapping its tentacle around her, squeezing the last bit of air out. And Mara calls out to Orm, and Orm swims up, throwing his trident through the brain sack, telling Mara, Calm down! As the Octodon falls, Mara begins to tell Orm nice work, but Orm shouts, Nereus of Zebel! 
Your game is over. You will give us an audience now, you primitive barbarian. We have proven ourselves according to your heathen ritual. Mara says that that isn't how she would have put it, but Orm is right. It's time to talk. So a short while later in the Zebel throne room, that many would have considered more of a war room for a war chief, Nereus says that he knows of the civil war in Atlantis. Kormrath took the throne and now there is dissent at his rule. That's why they've come here, isn't it? The Atlantean outcast and the turncoat princess come to plead for support in their war against King Wrath. Mera tells him that Wrath is a tyrant, a threat to Zebel. This crisis breeds unlikely alliances. Orm and herself, for example. Gorm Wrath's reign of terror affects them all. Nereus asks, is that so? There's always been bad blood between us and Atlantis. We survived by staying out of each other's business. Mera continues to state that Wrath is not like previous Atlantean kings. He has imperial dreams. Nereus clutches his fist, shouting, Then we will fight hard! And Orm yells, telling him, You will and you will lose. If Zebel commits its forces now, while Wrath is consolidating his power, there is a chance to unseat him. Nereus looks at Laron, asking, What does he think of this? These fools think that Zebel's going to fight for Atlantis? Mera tells him yes, but they won't be laughing when King Wrath's legions wipe Zebel from the ocean bed. If they side with the Atlantean rebels, they will be protecting themselves. The tyrant Wrath will doom the whole world if he's not stopped. Nereus says, All right. And then the next king of Atlantis will become a threat. And then the next, and then the next. History repeats itself. That if the half-breed Aquaman becomes king again, things won't change. Mera says, my husband has no intention of retaking the throne. Nereus gets up. Husband? There was a time when you would have been my queen. I would have made you happy. If you had just done your part and assassinated the air breather, Atlantis would have been at our mercy. But no, instead you had to fall in love with him and... Mera stops him, stating, You didn't love me and I didn't love you. Us together would have been a miserable match. New possibilities face us now. Nereus walks back to his throne, asking, And who would the new ruler be if not Wrath? Mera and Orm wait for a moment, and then Mera tells him, I will be. I've already been declared queen in exile. And as queen, I promise that if you stand with me, Zebel will have the gratitude and friendship of a Zebel-born Atlantean monarch. Nereus stares and Orm tells him, Yes, it took me a moment to process it as well. Laron leans in stating, Great gods of the deep, I am so very proud of you. Mira goes on stating that she was sent all those years ago to end the war with Atlantis. She didn't end it the way that they wanted, but with this, they can do so by other means. Nereus storms out of the throne room shouting, No, 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 the whole damn world's gone mad. Mira sighs stating that she knew he wouldn't be happy, but Laron stops her stating that he's just upset that she's outdone him, Queen of Atlantis? The king needs some time to cool down so he can see the good that can come of this. Stay here while I go and talk some sense into him. As Liron leaves, Mira says that she thinks it's going to be all right, and Orm tells her, right, things are going swimmingly. A short while later, the sound of metal hitting metal can be heard as the forces of Zebel train while Nereus and Orm watch. Orm says, you must see the sense in all of this. A chance like this only comes once in a thousand years. We have a chance to protect and secure Zebel and form a solid alliance with the future ruler of Atlantis. Nereus asks, siding with rebels, what if Wrath wins? Zebel would assuredly be targeted next. Orm tells him, no, the rebels will win. But if Wrath prevails, it will be the rest of the world that gets burned down, not just Zebel. One of the soldiers strikes another and then he looks up at Nereus and Nereus gives him the thumbs down. The soldier stabs the man in the chest and Nereus asks, do you miss it? Do you miss how the power feels? and Orm silently watches the soldiers continue to train. Later that night at Nereus' throne room, a shadowy person says that this is a chance to make gains. It could secure the future of Zebel forever, the removal of Wrath and neutering of Atlantis, all in one go. Nereus tells that person that Mara will resist, and the person asks, why does he care? Nereus says that they need an unbreakable bond of blood. He's already under Orm's skin. Are you prepared to deal with Mara? Lamia walks out, stating, of course, my lord king. She's delivered to us the means of achieving a great and last victory. It's time her granddaughter was properly punished for turning her back on Zebel. The next morning, Nereus sits for breakfast when he sees Orm walk in and he asks, Won't you sit with me for a meal? Orm tells him that he has his appreciation, but has he given thought to their proposal? Nereus takes a bite of his food, stating, Ha! Huh, straight to the point, huh? There's still a king in you somewhere. We need more men like you. You understand the complexities of the throne. You know how to make the hard choices. 
Yes, I've given some thought to aiding the rebels, but there are certain conditions that must be ironed out first. Orm asks, what does he mean? And Nereus says that you are asking me to side with an old enemy, with a traitor of our kingdom. There are opportunities here, one that we have not even considered. Allow me to explain. Later, as Mero spends time with Laron, Orm interrupts the conversation, stating that it is time. Nereus is ready to announce his decision. Mira swims up, stating that she has got a good feeling about this. They've accomplished something together. She's glad he came with her. Who would have imagined her saying that? And Orm tells her that he will always serve Atlantis. It's been a pleasure to act on the same side as her for once. Soon, everyone gathers in the throne room, and Nereus announces that by his royal decree, the armies of Zebel will commit against the tyrant Wrath. They will fight to protect Atlantis and their future. Mara smiles, stating that she's glad to hear it. It is a wise choice that he will not, but he stops her. There is one condition. Mira sighs, stating, there it is. He goes on stating, the armies of Zebel cannot be seen to follow a traitor. Orm must be the commander who leads them to war. Mira looks at Orm. Did you know about this? And Orm tells her, I suspected that he would have specific demands. She thinks about it, knowing that Nereus is trying to save face and says, very well. Orm can have field command in the fight to secure my throne. Lamia tells her, you misunderstand. Zebel will commit, provided that it is to restore Orm as the king of Atlantis. Mara tells them that they know that that's not possible. I am queen now. Nereus stands up from his throne asking, do you not accept these terms, even as the fate of your beloved Atlantis hangs in the balance? In the back of her mind, she thinks that maybe this could be good. She never asked to be queen. She could be free. Her and Arthur could be free from the power, the rule, and the duty. But for all that has changed, Orm still remains too dangerous to wear the crown. Mara says that to have a Zebel born on the throne of Atlantis will secure lasting peace between the warring kingdoms. And, but Lamia stops her, stating, you mistake this for a negotiation. Orm is a better choice and offers far more security for the future than you. Mara pauses for a moment and then turns to Orm. You struck the deal with them. Was this about the throne all along? Orm tells her, I was only thinking of Atlantis. It's the only way to bring Zebel into the fight on our side. And Mara asks him, what of Eren? What of Tommy? The life that he loved. They're waiting for him to return. Is he just going to forget them? Orm says that he will never forget them. But this is more important than them. Or me, and it is my duty. Mara begins to shout to Nereus that he knows full well that Orm is a dangerous man. How could he possibly offer them a more certain future as king? Nereus tells her, through blood, of course. Lamia smiles, stating that if the king of Atlantis is tied to the king of Zebel through a direct blood link, then peace is guaranteed. A bond between the families. Mara looks back at Orm, stating he didn't. Nereus goes on, stating, Orm is here to be my brother king and my brother-in-law. Just then, two guards walk in holding Tula, and she shouts, asking, What the hell is going on? Mara yells at Orm, asking, You're gonna marry off your sister by force? You're so desperate for power that you would sacrifice Tula for it? Your own sister! She lunges forward, punching Orm, but Orm gets ready to attack, with Nereus slamming his sword down, stating, That will be enough! Tradition forbids violence in the throne room. Mara, step away from the Atlantean king in exile. Mara shouts that Orm will not treat Tula like a pawn. Zebel will not get to decide who the next ruler of Atlantis is. Nereus tells her that she is a traitor with no position to argue. Guards control her. She may be a fine warrior, but she cannot take all of Zebel and win. She gets ready to say something back, but holds her tongue, stating that he is right. She can't, but she can fight for the throne. And as per Zebelian tradition, she demands trial by combat. Nereus tells her that that is absurd, but Lamia whispers to him that it is law. They cannot deny it. So Nereus then says, very well, by my royal decree, let combat decide. Tula yells to Mera that she can't. She's not strong enough yet. And Mera looks at Orm and tells him, I challenge you for the throne of Atlantis in single combat. Do you accept? Orm hesitates for a second and then tells her, yes, I accept. Later at the Strand Arena, the final preparations for Mera's fight begins, and Liron asks, Are you ready? Do you want my lance? She tells him no, and Liron yells, But he will have a damn weapon. She says yes. He is the Ocean Master. His trident channels the wrath of storms. A lance isn't going to help. As the iron bars begin to rise, Liron says, Just make sure that you win, and make it a good finish. Give them a show. She walks out telling him that there is no if. 
She stands before Orm and the crowds begin to surround and chant, Orm, Orm, Orm. Once the crowds die down, Nereus stands and tells the people, Hear the call of your king. We've assembled according to the tradition to witness the ritual trial by combat. The combatants will fight for the throne of our great rival nation, Atlantis. Let this, my will, be enacted. Orm Marius, of the royal Atlantean blood, his challenger, Mara, daughter of Zebel, to the victor, the crown, to the loser, death. The crowds cheer and Mara tells Orm that it is not too late, he can back out. This doesn't have to happen. And he yells that it must, it is my destiny, and only you stand in my way. I am honor bound to protect Atlantis. Mara asks what of his sister's life. He's also forgetting the love and the family that he left up above. How is he protecting them? He grips his trident and he says nothing from the surface matters. Not when Atlantis needs me. Before the two could go on, Nereus yells, enough, let the fight commence. Orm quickly hurls a bolt of lightning, which Mera evades, leaping in to punch Orm. She punches him over and over, telling him, people are nothing but pawns to you, tokens in your power games. Your toxic self-regard is why you will never be the king that Atlantis needs. Orm hits her back, knocking her down, shouting, you are not worthy of the throne. Let this be the end of you. He stabs down with his trident and Mara rolls out of the way, but at the last second, she blasts Orm back into a pile of shipwrecked debris. From the stands, Lamia says that Mara is holding her own and Nereus tells her, don't worry, the odds are stacked against her. I borrowed some of her water worms. The water worms lash out trying to bite at Mara and with her distracted, Orm fires another bolt of lightning. As the dust settles, Orm asks, are you slain or just wounded in hiding? Show yourself! From behind the rubble, Mera throws out parts of the shipwreck at Orm, and Orm releases all of his power, tearing through and asking, Is this your best? I am the Ocean Master. I will bury you where you stand. All of the metal begins to come down on Mera, and it's at this moment that she realizes something. She isn't strong enough. But that ends now. For far too long, she has borne the burdens of others. She never wanted any of this. Her training in Zebel taught her to be strong. Her life on the surface is a testament to that. It was never about wanting anything. It was about being something. Not a pawn, but instead a queen. She rips through the debris, using her power to control the water that is filling Orm's lungs. She tells him that he may command the ocean and the storm, but she commands the water itself, and she can stop the water from moving in his body. She has control over his very life. She can stop his breathing and trigger a stroke. Orm struggles to breathe, reaching for his trident, but before he can grab it, Mera summons it to her side. She holds the trident to Orm's throat, telling him, Nail before your queen! The crowds all cheer for Mera, and the guards quickly move in to capture Orm. He says, wait, I'm the Ocean Master. If she will not kill me, allow me to return to the surface with Aaron and Tommy. Mara asks, now you remember their names? You gave up that life when you challenged me for the throne, and you will now remain a prisoner of Atlantis. A man only gets so many second chances, Orm. She swims back to Nereus with Orm's trident in hand, telling him that she demands that he abide by the terms of this ritual. Recognize her authority and release Tula. Nereus raises his hand, telling the guards to free Tula, and Mara goes on asking, and the rest? Nereus tells her, I refuse to acknowledge the validness of this farce. And Mera says that he will prepare the war host. As Nereus begins to say no, Liron whispers to him that it is tradition and he must abide. The people will turn on him if he begins to break the codes. Remember that. Nereus sighs, stating, Damn it to hell. The Zebel host is at your bidding. Your majesty. Lamia tells Mera not to worry. He is angry, but bound by his word. Though it hasn't worked out the way he wanted, Zebel will aid Atlantis. Liron asks Lamia, did she manipulate this? And Lamia smiles, stating, only if her granddaughter proves strong enough. And to her surprise, she has. Tula hugs Mera. Mera tells her that she is happy to see her safe. But there is one thing that she must do. Later, at the surface, Tula walks out of the water, and Aaron and Tommy both run towards her. Aaron stops and asks, where is Orm? And Tula tells her that she knows she said Orm would be coming back, but she was wrong. Back in the Zebel throne room, Nereus tells Mera that the preparations are complete. She may take the Zebel host to war, though he will not be a part of it. Mera says that she will march upon Koam Wrath. The true queen of Atlantis is returning. She will claim her throne. She will cast out the tyrant. And all of the oceans of the world will tremble. Many years ago, Wrath found himself watching his father as he toiled and worked to build the foundations of Atlantis. 
He was Hadalyn of the Ninth Tried, and he was proud of what he did. He wore the brand of House Atlan to show his devotion, but all the work for the Hyde Tried brought him nothing more than an early grave. He died without strength nor respect of his royal masters, still believing that his offspring would make Atlantis great. Well, take a look now, father. But still, even as king, Wrath is surrounded by idiots. The barrier is gone, leaving Atlantis exposed to their enemies, all because his council couldn't even hold back a band of lowlifes. Back then, his father would have beat him because he was weak. He would try and help, but every time he accidentally dropped a stone and broke it, his father would lash out. But being in the Ninth Tribe, you begin to see what the sea can do to a person. Sea changed? No. They call them taint bloods, wretched mutants, altered by the sea. He loathed the most of them because even though they were Atlanteans, they accepted their underwater exile, and now Aquaman leads them in a rebellion? The man Merc was supposedly able to kill? Arthur Curry should be dead. The half-breed was a weakling who struggled to find balance between the land and the sea. Arthur was too scared to use Atlantis' magic, and now all of those around him have stiffened with the fear at the sight of it. Atlantis needs someone who won't flinch. Someone who will make them strong. He will start by burning away Arthur Curry. Even now, his friends conspire in secret turning against him. He has but only one ally remaining, Cadaver. While they were young, they would gaze up at the stars and he would tell Cadaver that one day, those towers would rise out of the ocean so that they may rule the world. Cadaver would laugh, stating that the only way that that would happen is if the gods of the sea answered the prayers of the poor, lowly Hadalyn. Cadaver was magically adept, and he would hone his skills in the stone pits because the magisters of the Silent School would never accept someone like him as a pupil. He never received the formal training that he deserved, and the Silent School failed. Magister Loke has great power, but is too timid to use it. It's time that the Silent School had a new master. Wrath reaches out to Cadaver, telling him to take off his mask. Cadaver pauses, but as he takes it off, Wrath tells him, Good. There's no reason to hide anymore. We are not outcasts. We are not Hadalyn's scum. This is the future that we dreamed about when we were children. The future where all the lords and the kings bow to us. Later at the Silent School, Wrath arrives and Magister Loke says that this is an unexpected visit. They're still repairing the damage done by the Rebel Raid. Wrath tells him the damage was done by him. You will let the undercurrent do this. This time, no more spells, no more charms. It is time to open up the well. Loke says that that is out of the question and with much great respect, it is too dangerous for any man to do. Wrath looks at Cadaver, telling him that it is treason for someone to refuse a direct order from the king. Without a word, Cadaver uses his magic to conjure Coral Reef, striking down all of the magisters, including Loke himself. Wrath watches, thinking that this is why he kept Cadaver around in secret. He does not hesitate. He needs someone dangerous, someone with the guise to use proper power without remorse. Wrath then leads Cadaver down into the ancient vault, stating what the Silent School was doing was merely scratching the surface of magic. Down here is the real power. The wellspring of all Atlantean sorceries rests behind these doors. This is the true secret the school has always protected. Power that the highborn kings locked away. He was never able to use it, but maybe someone as powerful as him. Cadaver casts his magic, breaking down the giant doors, and the white and black light wash over them. A voice calls out, asking who opens these doors. Wrath steps forward, stating that it is he, King Wrath, and he wants what is rightfully his, the raw power of the Abyssal Dark, the divine source of all Atlantean magic. The Abyssal Dark asks if he's certain. Kings have shunned him for a long time. He made them great, but they grew afraid of the power. Wrath tells him that he is certain. A new age is dawning. The Abyssal Dark says that by all means, take it. The Abyssal Dark bestows both Wrath and Cadaver with great magic, with Wrath smiling. He then shakes Cadaver's hand, stating that they did it. Everything that they've ever dreamed of. As Wrath grips, he feels Cadaver's hand change and slip out of his grasp. Cadaver's entire body transforms into some kind of undead monster, with Wrath shouting, asking, What is this? The Abyssal Dark tells Wrath that Atlanteans worshipped the gods of the sea, but in truth, the demons of the sea are much more powerful. This is the power that you wanted. Mastery over the Abyssal Dark gives one command over all things. See your oldest friend? At the slightest touch, he became totally obedient. All willpower washes away. That is power, King. Cadaver kneels down stating hail to the king of always. Wrath pauses and says, yes, yes, thank you. That will be all. The Abyss of Dark then asks, what will the king do now? And Wrath says that he will eradicate all of those that oppose him. First the consul, then Aquaman. A short while later over the ninth tried, Vice and King Shark fight back with the drift, and just as the tide is turning in their favor, Shark notices something. 
Just then, Cadaver lunges out, stating that this defiance ends. In the name of the king, you will perish. The Drush soldiers stop asking if that is Cadaver. What the hell happened to him? Another says that if Lord King sent him to help, praise be. But the gods can't bear to even look at him. Cadaver tells the soldiers that he comes so that they may hear the king's voice. And through Cadaver, Wrath tells the soldiers that he has sent this instrument to assist them in the persecution of their enemies. Stand fast and destroy the rebel scum. The captain then says, please, we are spent and beaten from the conflict. How can we fight on? And Wrath yells, I shall strengthen you then. I will share with you the power that I have imbued in my instrument, Cadaver. Cadaver waves his hand, releasing the dark magic into the water, turning all of the drift soldiers into undead monsters. Same as Cadaver. The drift begin to slaughter the rebellion, and just before they can get to Bice, Shark swims by, grabbing him. Bice shouts, damn it! We're no safer here than we were over there. Fighting the Mad King is one thing, but we can't fend off magics like this. Just before Cadaver could strike, Arthur rips into Cadaver with his trident shouting, and I will send Cadaver back to hell. Arthur tears through hordes of undead, telling Bice and Shark to get their men ready. I will keep the devils busy. Bice yells that they can't leave Aquaman to face this alone, but Shark tells him that the trident is the only type of magic that can hurt these things. Break off now! Arthur cuts down another wave, and just then he's struck by a blast. He starts to pick himself back up, but Merc floats close over to him, telling him that by the order of his majesty, King Wrath, Aquaman shall die. Back at the royal palace, Wrath watches the battle between Arthur and Merc, stating, All is well. My throne will be secure. My gratitude to you, my ancient friend. The Abyssal Dark says, I have been shut away for far too long. I am glad that a king with wisdom has released me. It is time to lend you my full power to the cause so that Atlantis may be restored to glory. Wrath tells him, I appreciate you, but... Wait, what is this? Wrath looks at himself in the mirror and his face begins to change, transforming into the same as Cadaver. He begins to shout, what horror is this? And the Abyssal Dark tells him, the inevitable transmutation. You wanted power. Such things do not come free. As the darkness begins to surround Wrath, he yells, I cannot become some taint blood, please. Just then the very foundation of Atlantis begins to shake and Wrath asks, what's happening? Why is there an earthquake? The Abyssal Dark tells him, Oh, be still. The tremors will ease. Atlantis is shifting. It approves your actions and urges you to do more. Wrath pauses and then says, That if Atlantis itself trembles at my might, then I will press on and bring the darkness down. Back in the ninth, Merc swings at Arthur, telling him that he shouldn't have come back. Arthur strikes back, asking, Come back? You're the one who murdered me. Merc knocks Arthur back, telling him, I never wanted you dead. I even came to like you, but you were a poor king, far too focused on everything but the people of Atlantis. Arthur asks, You faked it? Gods, I couldn't have figured out how I survived. Merc tells him, I didn't want you dead. I just didn't want you to be king. I made it look like an execution so the elders would consent. Spine eel venom made you appear dead. Figured you might just leave and go back to the surface and live your life out in peace. So why come back? Why the hell did you? Arthur kicks Merc in the chest, shouting, Because I had no choice. Look around. Look at what Wrath is doing. The two go back and forth, exchanging blow for blow, until Arthur finally knocks Merc down into a rock formation. Merc coughs, stating, Go on then. Better to be dead than live in this hell. Arthur thrusts his trident down, but he stops right before Merc's throat, telling him, I didn't come back for the throne. Merc asks, what? Arthur goes on telling him, I just want Atlantis to be free from this horror. Isn't that what you want? To save the people. Wrath can still be stopped. You are still the commander of the King's Guard. Get me close to Wrath. Merc asks, and then? Arthur reaches down to help him up, telling him, we stop Wrath together. Back at the royal palace, Elder Liat and the other council gather to discuss their current situation, and Liat says the time has come. Are they all agreed? The other council members then state that they support the removal at once. Liat looks at Urshel, telling him, See, this isn't a coup. This is all legal due process. We will remove Wrath just as we did that weakling Curry. Urshel says that Wrath won't like this, but when he understands that all of the city, including the elder council, is withdrawing their support, he must relinquish the throne. Urcel and Liat lead the charge into Wrath's chambers, calling out to him, but they get nothing. The drift soldiers begin to look around, and just then, everyone is electrocuted. Wrath steps out, fully transformed into a sea monster, stating, Oh, hi, elders! I don't think you really understand what power is. A short while later at the palace gates, Merc comes up telling one of the guards to step aside. He's bringing a prisoner in. The guard looks at Arthur and cuffs and yells, Triton's teeth! You've captured Aquaman! The king will make fine sport of this. Arthur breaks the chains, grabbing the guard with Merc, shouting, Oh no! 
What will we ever do? Arthur then takes out the rest of the guards as Merc opens the gates and says, make sure not to get any heroic ideas. Arthur asks, what is that supposed to mean? And Merc tells him anything like subtly having compassion. The wrath is Hadeland scum. If given a chance, kill him. Arthur pauses and says, wait, don't you think he should stand trial? Merc tells him, Wrath will not surrender the throne or himself. He needs to die. But don't fret, Angelfish. You'll be the one to take him out. Arthur asks, I'm not sure, assassination? And Merc scoffs, telling him, That's what I meant by heroic. Don't flinch. A kill shot against an enemy is the best way to help the rebels. The two continue to make their way through the inner workings of the palace, when Arthur heads off to get into position. As he thinks about what Merc said about killing Wrath, he hears someone calling out to him. He hurries over to see Uracel beaten and battered, and as she bumps into him, she screams for him to get away. Arthur grabs her, telling her to be still. Does she not know who he is? And she starts laughing, stating, of course she does. She's been wishing him dead for weeks, but it hardly matters. He's, he's killing everyone. Arthur asks who? Merc? And Uracel shouts, no, Wrath, Quorum, Wrath! He's not human anymore! Over in the throne room, Merc arrives to it destroyed, asking, Lord King? And he sees Liot's body floating with Wrath telling him, Yes, Elder Liot and the others, they displeased me. They tried to take the throne! Can you imagine that, Merc? Merc asks, What would you have him do? And Wrath tells him, You are such a devoted servant, always dutifully serving your king. Except today, I am not the king you serve. Merc calls out to Wrath, stating that he doesn't understand what he means. He only serves the throne. And Wrath bursts through the wall, stabbing into Merc, shouting, A liar! After throwing his body to the ground, Wrath pushes over a pillar, asking, Does it hurt? Merc groans as he tries to crawl away, but Wrath holds out his hands as he gathers power, stating, Behold, a gift that will take away that pain. Now close your... But just then, Arthur shouts to Merc to run away as he uses the trident to push Wrath back. Wrath punches Arthur off, stating, It is the false king! How delicious you've come back. He then uses the dark magic to pin Arthur down, telling him, You stay right there. He the abyssal dark. Blister his soul, and please scream if you need to. As Arthur screams out in pain, Merc leans up quietly, stating, You idiot. I warned you not to hesitate. Now we're both going to die. Meanwhile, over at the Atlantean royal treasury, Volko says that this is it. Just follow Dolphin's Luminous. Shark asks, what are they doing in the old crypt? Their men are. But Volko stops him yelling, Here! These fishers! They weren't here last time! Shark shouts, telling him to go on with it. Why are they here when Cadaver could be upon them any second? Undyne says that she's pretty sure they're exactly where they need to be. Just then, a ghostly voice calls out to Volko. Oh, my old friend, you have returned. A faceless specter floats through the wall with Volko shouting, Elder Null! Times are desperate, my friend. I thank you for giving me the royal trident before, but now I ask that the ancient specters help me against a wrath himself. Null tells him, Dear friend, I'm afraid there's nothing we can do. The shades here are sworn to protect Atlantis, and for better or for worse, wrath is Atlantis. Sadly, you are on your own. Over at the throne room, Wrath stands over Arthur, stating, The great hero, reduced to the role of a villainous assassin, here to murder a man. But behold, I am not a man. Arthur climbs out of the debris, asking, What? What the hell happened to you? Before Wrath could answer, a blade shoots out from his chest and then is ripped out, with Merc yelling, Leave him be, you sea-changed freak! Wrath covers the wound, telling him, That hurt! Merc asks, Oh yeah? Just wait till you feel. Wrath's tentacles lash out, grabbing Merc, stabbing through his body. And using his other hand, Wrath grabs and tears at Merc's bladed arm. He lets go of Merc's body, allowing it to bleed out, with Arthur using the power of the trident to blast Wrath through the wall, shouting, You bastard! Arthur hurries over to Merc, and Merc asks, Did you kill him? And Arthur tells him, No. Merc yells, Then go finish the job! But Arthur picks him up, telling him, There's no time, you're bleeding out. Merc groans, telling him, forget about me and kill the beast. Arthur tells him he can't. His power is on a whole new level. We need to regroup and figure out what we're dealing with. Merc doesn't respond, and Arthur just shouts, Merc, Merc! Down in the catacombs, Voko asks Null, why can't you help? After everything we've risked to get here. And Null tells him, I'm sorry, and I wish we could, but our kind was created by the Silent School. When we died, we pledged our afterlives to eternity to safeguard the kingdom. Wrath is the king, and we are magically bound from raising a hand against him. Just then, Shark and Dolphin notice something, and when they turn back, they see Cadaver and a horde of undead drift swimming towards them. Over in the king's royal chambers, Wrath calls out to anyone, asking if they're there. As no one answers, he says that he just wanted Atlantis returned to its former glory. The abyssal dark slithers out, telling Wrath, Get up. Your wounds have already healed. Wrath says, It would seem that you're still here. I was beginning to think you a liar. Such fine promises you made. 
but I am a king hunted in my own palace, my dream. The Abyssal of Dark stops him, telling him, your dream was too small. The Atlanteans are a stubborn race. They don't have the courage to realize their full potential. They never did. The path? Do you see how it will end if you persist? Wrath begins to see an army of undead raging war on Atlantis, and the Abyssal Dark telling him, the deathless forces locked in a war with the rebels, a kingdom consumed by war. You will triumph, yes, but you will triumph over ruins. Atlantis will not survive this conflict. That is why we must bring it all down. Destroy Atlantis so that we may move on to take the seat at a greater throne. One that rules over the entire world. Later over the Tower of Widowhood, Arthur and Bice watch over Merc as the Sisterhood attempts to save his life even after having his arm ripped off. Seta says that they fled the palace, and Arthur says they had no choice. Merc was dying. Bice tells him that that might not have been the best choice. Old Merc will probably still die, but he's a soldier and he understands sacrifice, but that fight is worth it, that is. Seta leans in telling Arthur that he wasted his chance to end Wrath because of some weak, sentimental attachment to Merc. That bleeding heart is what made you a bad king. This compassion, this mercy, it's a crippling weakness. I cannot fight for one life. How can I fight as all? Besides, I took my best shot. I used all the power that Trident had and it still wasn't enough. He became impossibly powerful. Seta steps back stating, oh great gods, and just then Volko calls out, don't give up old girl. Everyone looks back to see Volko holding Cadaver's head. And he goes on stating, Behold, Cadaver is dead. Really, actually dead. Against the odds, my little band has found a way to fight Wrath's unholy magic. Undyne says that he isn't lying either. There's someone that they should all meet. Elder Null and the rest of the Spectres float out, with Volko stating that this is Elder Null and some of uh, my friends. Don't be alarmed. The Elder and his companions are spectral guardians of the treasury. They've committed their souls to defending Atlantis. Null tells Arthur that he greets the Lord King, and Arthur says that he is not king, though. Null says that he is more king than Gorm Wrath is. Volko then yells that that's the trick to it. The Shades are bound to serve the king, but Wrath isn't king anymore. He's an instrument of the dark. And once the Shades saw what kind of forbidden power Wrath's minions were wielding, Shark burst out laughing, stating, You should have seen it! The Shades turned on Cadaver in his drift and tore them apart! Bice says that he doesn't like this one bit, but they suppose that to stop someone from using magic, they're gonna have to use magic themselves. Seta says that Bice is right, this is reckless, the Abyssal Dark is the oldest magic, the wellspring of all Atlantean sorcery. Null stops her, telling her, Not so. The history has lied to you. The Dark trades and lies. It twists the truth so that men would believe that they are tempted to join the Dark, but the Abyssal Dark is... A demon that stalked Atlantis since the beginning of time. Null goes on stating that Wrath heard the demon's whispers and released it. He's in its thrall. Arthur then says that Seta and Bice are right. They're playing with forces that they barely understand. He already used every scrap of power the Trident has and... But just then, Null and the other Spectres begin to imbue the Trident with their powers, stating that they will share their protective magic. If he truly believes in the strength of Atlantis, it will be effective. Now, they... But before he could finish, there's an explosion as Wrath comes in to raise the Widowhood Towers. Arthur rushes out to stop Wrath, and Wrath asks, Oh, you've come to try your luck again? I can't be stopped, Aquaman! Arthur stabs the trident into his chest, telling him, This will be the last time! Wrath smacks Arthur away, asking, Is that it? But then Wrath rips the trident out of himself, snaps it in half, shouting, Your magics are nothing to the Abyssal Dark. All of you are lost. Wrath picks up Arthur by the neck, telling him, Your unbreakable trident is shattered, and now I will shatter Atlantis and sink it into the abyss. As Wrath begins to strike, Dolphin swims up to try and help Arthur, but ends up being smacked away by one of Wrath's tentacles. The Abyssal Dark tells Wrath to come, no more delays. Topple the Widowhood's Tower, collapse the sacred heart of this city! Wrath begins to make his way inside, and Volko shouts to Seta that they must go. But Seta stands their ground, telling him, No. She will not leave her home. Volko tries to swim to her, but Undyne pulls him back, stating, Come on, old man! We have to leave! Seta starts to quietly recite the old prayers, and Wrath tells her, Those prayers are worthless. Neptune isn't listening! I am a god now! Wrath begins to wind up to strike, but before he can, he's struck in the back by a blue light. Mara comes riding in with the Zebel Legion, shouting, The reign of Korm Wrath is over! Arthur hears Mara's voice, and as he gets back up, he weakly holds Dolphin's hand, telling her that he has to go help. Even if they can't win. He begins to pick up the broken trident, stating, You have to get clear of this place. Save anyone you can and go. Wrath attacks Mara, telling her that he has already slain the false king. A false queen is a mere afterthought. 
as the Zebel forces rush in to aid her. Volko and the others grab weapons as they can and they begin to join the battle. With Wrath's forces focused on everyone else, Mera takes Orm's trident, jumping off the giant Octodon. And as she gets closer, Wrath notices. Mera's smiling. Why is she smiling? In that moment of hesitation, Arthur takes the broken trident, stabbing it into Wrath's eye. And Mera tells him, oh, no reason. Wrath struggles to throw Arthur off, but Arthur grips tighter, telling him, I have to thank you because of you. Atlantis is united in ways that I could never do. From the highest tries to the depths, even Zebel, for God's sakes, we all have a common enemy. Before Arthur could drive the rib further, Mera calls out to him, telling him that he has to pull back. As the trident is pulled out, the Abyssal Dark seeps out, asking, Where will I go? It's cold out here. Damn you, Arthur Curry. I am lost and scattered to the tides. You have won, but not as you expected. I was the only thing preventing this. Now your wish is coming true. Remember, you asked for this. Mara asks, what did that mean? And Arthur says, I don't know. The demon's gone and only wrath remains. Mara gets ready to strike, but Arthur tells her, wait. Using my aqua telepathy, I can tell you that wrath has become more fish than man, more sea touched than the people of the ninth. In his quest for power, he seems to have allowed himself to become the thing that he hated the most, a creature of the deep. May he find solace in that fact. As Wrath slowly swims away, Mera watches and says, Gods, I almost pity him. With Wrath gone, the people of Atlantis cheer in victory, and Arthur grabs Mera, stating, He can't. But Mera tells him don't talk, just kiss her already. As they do, Arthur pulls back, asking, Is that Arm's trident? And she tells him, Yeah, went in a fight. But what did the demon mean? Your wish is granted. It seems more than just an empty taunt. But just then, the seafloor rumbles and it shakes, and it begins to launch all of Atlantis upward. Shark asks what is going on. Is Atlantis sinking after everything that they've done? And Arthur tells him no. Oh no, I know what this is. When I stood with the Justice League armored in the magical 10th medal, I made a wish, my deepest desire. I longed for a place where I could live the life that I wanted. Somewhere that exists between my two worlds, a place of sea and land. As the sun begins to shine on the surface risen city, Mehra asks, Arthur, what have you done? And Arthur says, forgive me. It seems I have raised all of Atlantis. And there you have it. Aquaman Rebirth, the full story. What did you guys think of this one? Personally, I really enjoyed the Aquaman Rebirth when it came out, and so I hope you all did too. Anyway, be sure to subscribe to the channel, like the video, leave a comment down below, and we will see you next time. Rest in peace, Benny.